We on? Yep, we just started. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the Gamma Atheist Hangouts uh, on uh, my YouTube channel here. Uh, today we have uh, Dave Moscato, Public Relations Director from American Atheist. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. should be fun. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, pretty exciting. I'm uh, really excited that our topic today is keys to effective debating and how to talk religion without pissing people off. So we usually see that a lot of this online. Um, and if for, for many of you that aren't familiar with American Atheists, uh, you can check, find out more about them on atheist.org. And they also have an upcoming conference that you guys are, you guys started uh, selling tickets for that, correct? Yeah, uh, we just opened the early bird pricing and uh, registrations now online. If you go to uh, atheists.org uh, slash convention 2014, that's our registration page. It has all the details about the convention. It's in Salt Lake City this year uh, in April uh, over Easter weekend, April 17th through 20th, that Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, our uh, keynote speakers, we have Chris Cluey, who's the uh, punter for the NFL uh, Oakland Raiders. Um, we have Denise Stapley, who is the uh, grand prize winner of Survivor Philippines. And we have Mark White, who is the Grammy-nominated bass player of Spin Doctors, uh, plus about 30 other speakers. There's a costume party. There's a uh, art show. There's uh, babysitting options for children. Um, oh, gosh, uh, all sorts of stuff. Uh, Stand-up comedy. There's live music. I mean, just it's going to be a really great time. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm really excited for it. I went last year. I went to the one in Austin. It was my first one, first conference, and everything. And it was an amazing time. I learned so much, and I am hooked for life. So, to any of those, anybody that has been thinking about going to a conference, debating, going back and forth, I highly recommend, uh, especially the American Atheist Convention. So, all right. Um, you can also, if you want to find out more information on American Atheists, you can uh, like their Facebook page and also follow them on Twitter and find Dave Moscato on Twitter as well. So um, without further ado, we can uh, jump into the topic at hand. Um, okay. Go ahead and start pulling up that PowerPoint. Yep, let's see. I'm, I'm doing a screen share here. So if this works correctly, uh, you should be able to see a spiral galaxy. Is that correct? I see a black screen. OK, give oh, a second. I see the galaxy now, yeah. OK. So let me start the slideshow, and then you should see the. Uh, uh, I do want to part let, of it. Yep, yeah, I see that. OK. I do want to let everyone know uh, if you want to get your questions in for live Twitter. Twittering, uh, tweet to the hashtag Atheist Hangouts. Again, get, to get your uh, live questions in for Dave and myself, uh, Atheist, hashtag Atheist Hangouts. And I do want to emphasize, um, this, is a, this is a workshop. It's not a lecture. I, I would like for people to participate. So please feel free um, during the talk, not just at the, the Q&A at the end, which we'll also do if people have additional questions. Um, like he was saying, you know, tweet your tweet your questions and comments um, for the live stream. Uh, our channel, our feed rather, is at American Atheist. Uh, that's singular, American Atheist. And Dave's is Gamma Atheist. Um, and then use the hashtag Atheist Hangouts, um, which we'll be searching for throughout. Um, okay, so let's get started. The yep. title of this talk is Keys to Effective Debating: How to Talk Religion Without Pissing People Off. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, I'm Dave Moscato. I'm the Public Relations Director for American Atheists. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, you're welcome to do that. It's just my name. Um, like I said, uh, the American Atheist feed is at American Atheist. Uh, I would encourage you to join our Facebook page. We post all sorts of stuff there, uh, news, articles, uh, blog posts, uh, funny memes and pictures and things, plus more serious stuff. Um, we do something called Fallacy Friday, where every Friday we talk you through a common fallacy and examples that religionists use uh, to debate religion, and then we break it down and show why it's incorrect. We do something called Mailbag Monday, which is where we post hate mail that we get and just uh, show what, what kind people a lot of religionists are. Uh, our website, like I mentioned earlier, is atheists.org. If you'd like to reach me for additional questions 
or uh, to have copies of these slides sent to you or anything else, my email address is dmoscato at atheists.org, or you can call me at my office. My office number is 908-276-7300, and my extension is 7. Okay, so let's start talking about what we want to accomplish here today. I think it's really important anytime you're, uh, you're setting out to do something that you, you delineate exactly what your goals are so that you know that if you've met them or not. So the first thing that we want to do is improve the effectiveness of our day-to-day -day conversations about religion and about atheism. So when I say uh, without pissing people off, I'm not saying that you, you necessarily should not piss people off or that you should try uh, not to. I, I, the point of this workshop is to teach you how people get pissed off and what does it, what triggers that, so that if you, if you uh, choose to do it, you understand what's going on and you can do it in a controlled way rather than by accident um, if that's not what you want to do. So the other thing we're going to talk about is how to improve your effectiveness in structured debates if we have time to get to that. Uh, I cut this down, this was originally two separate one-hour talks. And um, I'm doing it as a workshop, which means we'll have questions and discussion in the middle. Plus, it's now like 45 minutes or so on unstructured and 15 minutes or so on structured. So we'll get to that if we have time. Um, this is also about just being a better representative of atheism in general. In a lot of cases, if you're talking to somebody, uh, you might be the only out atheists that they know. and I mean, it's not fair and it's it's not appropriate, but they might see you as the face of atheism and expect you to be able to answer for all atheists and explain the whole of atheism as far as who you are to them. Um, that's, like I said, not, not fair, and that's not really how it works, which we all know. But if you want to represent atheism well, it you need to be informed about, about it and how people will perceive you, and that's part of what we'll be talking about. Uh, and then uh, I, I just hope you learned something today. That's kind of the point. So a couple of things um, while we're getting started here. Um, some definitions, just so we're on the same page about this stuff. When I say discussion, uh, this is not the same thing as a, as a debate. Uh, a discussion is an informal, unstructured um, exchange of ideas. So uh, I don't know if, if anybody is... Uh, familiar with the, the terms in cultural anthropology when you're when you're interviewing somebody and you're, you're taking field notes you there's informal versus formal and there's structured versus unstructured interviews so an informal interview would be uh, if you're just sitting down with somebody and you don't uh, you don't tell them outright okay let's schedule an interview and I'm gonna be taking notes and I'm going to be using this for you know whatever research um, it's just interacting with them day to day and just living with them and and chatting it's it's not it's not an official thing where you make it clear to them that you are going to be using this later um, versus uh, formal where you you schedule it and they know that this is going to be used in that way uh, structured versus unstructured structured means that you have a specific set of questions that you ask the same person or excuse me that you ask different people uh, through each time you do an interview. So you, like a list of things that you go over uh, if, you're, if you're doing field work like that versus unstructured interviews where you don't have specific questions or a list of questions. Um, it's You just talk to them and find out where the discussion goes naturally, organically. Um, so when I say discussion, uh, again, this is an informal, unstructured exchange of ideas about uh, religion or, or whatever you're talking about. Uh, your participants in a discussion address each other directly as opposed to a debate where there's an audience that you're addressing. Uh, a discussion does not have to happen in one sitting. It can be ongoing over days, over weeks, over years. If you have a, an email discussion with somebody, uh, I, I have several of these going right now at the same time of uh, people who have just asked questions and then I answer them whenever I can get to it and it's been going on for months and we're just you know talking about religion type stuff I consider that a discussion even though it's not like I talk to him on the phone for two hours straight um, so the goal of a discussion is to 
convince the other person to see your point of view. That's the person that you're addressing with this as opposed to an audience again. Uh, so a lot of times um, arguing is misunderstood as quarreling. They are not synonymous. Uh, a quarrel is a disagreement between two people who usually are on good terms. Um, it's, it's a verbal fight, which is not the same thing as arguing. Uh, arguing is uh, specifically and explicitly uh, an argument is a series of premises followed by a conclusion. It's a, it's a logical official term um, and that's what it means. So in this talk uh, workshop when I say argument uh, that's what I mean. I'm talking about a series of premises followed by a conclusion. So next up is uh, valid versus invalid. Um, if you've ever studied, you know, just intro to logic stuff, this is going to be uh, very familiar to you and you can, you know, space out for a second, but uh, it's important that we cover it in case you're not familiar with these terms. So a valid argument, um, it's, the, these two terms have uh, very specific meanings within logic and, and debate. Um, valid means that the argument is not a non sequitur. In other words, uh, the conclusion logically follows from the premises. They are related in a, in a logically valid way. Um, for example, um, a, an invalid argument might be something like, um, the, if the dog is asleep, then my mom likes to drink tea. The dog is asleep, therefore my mom likes to drink tea. There is no logical relationship between my mom liking tea and the dog being asleep, so that would be invalid. Um, so a sound argument uh, is, is also an important thing to understand. Um, sound means that not only is your argument uh, valid, that is the conclusion logically follows from the premises, but the premises themselves are actually true statements. So a sound argument is true and deductively valid. Uh, an argument, like I said before, it can be valid without being sound, um, but by definition all sound arguments are also valid arguments. So a argument that's valid without being sound would be one where the conclusion logically falls from the premises, but one of the premises is false. Um, for example, uh, I mean, and this is basically any argument for the existence of God, uh, that's what it's going to look like, where you say, like, uh, something can't come from nothing, uh, blah, blah, you know, something like that. That's, that's just an assertion that's not a true statement, so that would not be a sound argument because one of your premises is false. Um, so moving on to the definition. Uh, real, real quick, David. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I do have a question that kind of goes along with that. Uh, okay. From um, <clears throat> Dan Orell, um, he asks, what common arguments do atheists use that you find unhelpful and try to avoid? Well, as far as, uh, let's see, um, it, really, it really depends on what arguments the other person is making because we have the negative position in this. If somebody is making a positive claim about the existence of God, it's really up to atheists to respond to that by breaking down their argument and showing why it's not valid or why it's not sound. So uh, I wouldn't say that there are really arguments that, that we should avoid. There are certain things you shouldn't do, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, I would advise uh, there is a, a strong and important difference between not making it, but between showing somebody that their argument is wrong or uh, is, isn't valid and making a positive counter argument. So like for example, if somebody tries to tell you that the earth was created in 6,000 years, uh, you need not walk them through and, and make a case for the Big Bang Theory. That is making a positive argument that's counter to their argument. That is one way to show them that they're wrong. but it's harder because now you have to defend the Big Bang Theory, which means you're going to be talking a lot about cosmology. You're going to have to convince them of a lot of, of evidence-based facts that they might not be accepting to. Uh, whereas if you can just show them that they're wrong about the 6,000 years, um, 
then you've you've effectively broken down what they're saying without having to defend something yourself. So uh, I hope that that answers your question. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Great. Um, so we were talking about uh, the definition of a formal debate, um, which is is not the same we mentioned earlier as a discussion. So a debate it's it's a formal, like I said, that means that you know it has a set time that you agree upon. Uh, you you know you advertise it. You have an audience there. It's it's uh, a, a structured thing like that. Um, uh, it is structured in in the the same sense that I was using before, as in you have um, set questions that you agree upon in advance, and uh, they know that this is the way that it's set up. Um, not all debates necessarily have set questions like that. We'll talk a little bit about different types of debates later, but um, the the point of a debate uh, you you have opposing points of view that you argue. Uh, usually, you'll have a moderator who will keep time and enforce the rules and direct the Q and A part of it. Um, so the way these work, the affirmative side, that is the side that's making the positive claim. Uh, for example, if the argument is, uh, or excuse me, if the debate topic is uh, is Christianity true or something like that, then the uh, the positive side would be the Christian who is making the argument yes. Christianity is true, and the negative side would be the atheist or just the non-Christian, whatever, um, who's making the argument that the Christian is incorrect on that. Um, and again, you're not necessarily arguing that atheism is true in order to argue that Christianity is not true. That would be making a positive claim. So um, one thing to keep in mind, uh, like I, I mentioned, the affirmative side uh, that's making the positive claim goes first. And then the negative side argues against the claim made by the affirmative side. Um, this is this is an important thing to keep in mind when you're debating. You, you are arguing against the affirmative side's arguments. Um, that is, not necessarily against uh, the claim itself. Um, if they present an argument that is a fallacy, then you explain why it's fallacious. You don't necessarily argue that their claim is wrong because then it's expected that you will provide uh, the correct answer for what they're claiming, and that's that's potentially making a positive claim for something else which you want to avoid, um, unless that's what you're trying to do. So another major difference between debating and, and discussing, um, and this is probably the one of the most important points, is that when you're debating, you are addressing the audience. You are not addressing each other, except during the cross-examination part of it, uh, and occasionally during the Q&A. You know, you'll have uh, a clarifying question or something for your opponent. But um, the the people that you're that you're speaking to, that you're looking at, that you're talking to, as far as what voice you're using, uh, it's the audience. It's not your opponent. Okay, so. We'll start with informal debates, um, also called discussions. Um, so here's some, some things, just tips and things to keep in mind uh, as you're going through a discussion. The first one is be patient. Um, if you do a lot of these, like I do, uh, or if you live in an area where there are not a lot of atheists around, you're probably going to do this quite a bit, whether you want to or not. Um, keep in mind that just because you have heard these arguments a hundred times and rebutted them a hundred times does not mean that the person asking you has ever heard it rebutted before. So you have to be nice to them and not blow them off and not uh, blow through the rebuttal. Um, they are not necessarily going to understand what the word a logical fallacy or the phrase logical fallacy means. They are not going to understand uh, the, de the difference between natural selection and evolution and speciation, stuff like that. They're not used to talking about this stuff or they would be atheists. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just keep in mind, just because you know this and just because you've done this before does not mean that they know this and they've done it before. Um, so, the second thing, um, be kind to the person that you're talking to. In a, and this is not necessarily the case with debates, but with discussions, 
the person you're talking to is your conversation partner. You're not opposed to them just because you're disagreeing on something. Um, the word kind, uh, it's, it's the same root word as the Germanic kin, that, you know, like a family member kin. And that's the point that I want you to keep in mind is that treat them nicely. Treat them like you respect them, um, even if you don't respect what they're saying. And, uh, and be friendly because you're going to, to make more progress in being effective by doing this. Um, let them speak. This is very important. Um, you should be listening the majority of the time when you're having a discussion. The, the reason for doing this uh, is that people, if you, it's, how do I want to explain this? If you let people talk themselves through their arguments and you just ask nudging questions at the right time, they will see on their own that what they're saying doesn't make sense and it will affect them more permanently and more deeply than if you just explain for them why they're wrong. It's the same reason why uh, if you're trying to learn to play a musical instrument, you can't just watch a video of somebody else doing it. You have to do it yourself. Um, it's, it takes practice walking through uh, arguments logically and breaking them down and stuff like that. And if you can guide the, the person you're talking to through that process, they will understand it much, much better. Um, so you should be, like I was saying, listening the majority of the time. Let them work it out. Let them explain it to you um, and realize it doesn't make sense. Uh, the best thing that happens during a discussion is when they back down off of their own claims. Um, it's, it's the same, like if you're ever in a, in a negotiation, um, and it's the, the worst thing that you can do is talk yourself you know, down. If, if, you're, if you're selling something and they just sit there and stare at you and you, you lower the price, it's like if they didn't even say anything, you're just talking yourself out of it. So don't, uh, don't do that when you're negotiating. But um, in this type of situation, let, let them work it out and talk to you. Okay. So that but at the end, the reason I say but is because you don't want to let them machine gun. Uh, and this is a term that I use to mean switch rapidly from claim to claim or from argument to argument, um, people, w when they get to the point where they are about to concede because they're, they realize that what they just said doesn't make sense um, or that the evidence is against them, it's difficult for people to say, oh, gosh, you know, I was wrong about that. I guess I'll change my mind. That's not something that we like to say. We don't like thinking that we're wrong. It's just not the way our brains work. So people have a tendency to just change the subject because it's more comfortable for them. Um, it's important that you do not let them do this. When they get to that point in the argument where they realize that what they just said doesn't make sense or what they're claiming is wrong, uh, and they say, okay, well, how about, and they just pull up, you know, a completely different one. Say, well, let's finish this one first. Do you agree that blah, 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 wherever you were, wherever you were with that? And if they do, then say, okay, well, can you admit that that was wrong? And then also logically following from that, that you will never use that argument with anyone ever again, because you, you just said that you agree that it's wrong. Uh, and then we can move on to the next question that you have about your claim. So that's what that means. Um, so, okay, when you're using the, a term, any term um, that has disagreed upon definitions, um, you, you, need to under, you need to have a mutual understanding of what you're talking about. Um, a lot of people mean very, very different things by the word God, by the word miracle, by the word even resurrect. Um, you want to make sure that you're on the same page so that when they make a claim and you say, oh, you know, okay, I grant that, now let's talk about it, that they understand that you're granting the same thing that they think you're granting. Um, for example, like the way that I uh, would define a miracle is something that is uh, impossible um, given the way our universe's laws are set up, uh, the, you know, the patterns of physics in this universe. Um, it's by definition the least likely explanation for something. That is, you can only conclude that something is a miracle if you have absolutely ruled out every possible natural explanation, which is impossible. I mean, you can't do that. So by the definition that I use for miracles, it is, it is never possible to have a miracle, which theists are not going to like, 
um, but they can argue for a different definition if they can justify it. Uh, so that that kind of thing. Um, if uh, if you're if you're trying to work out what a term means, um, don't tell them what it means. Ask them what they think it means, and ask them to explain to you why they think it means that, and then offer your side of it as far as what you understand it to mean and why you disagree with their justification for it um, and, and your counter to it if you have a counter. Um, uh, the same thing goes for you. Uh, if you use a term, especially a term that you think they might not know very well, uh, make sure you define it clearly. I mentioned earlier the difference between natural selection and evolution and speciation. Um, I mean, people who have not studied evolutionary biology do not, they don't know what taxonomy means. They don't know what cladistics is. It's, this is stuff that you have to understand if you're going to explain to somebody um, how natural selection works and how we know that evolution happens and so on. And um, if, you, if you just assume that they know this stuff, um, they are not going to believe you when you're done explaining why you're right. When, um, when you're talking to somebody, body language is extremely important. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit. Um, but there, I mean, just the basics, you know, look them in the eye, uh, lean in, pay attention to what they're saying. Um, don't uh, look around, you know, like look over their shoulder, you know, like you're not paying attention. Don't, don't pick your nails. Don't play with things. Don't be fidget. Um, stuff like that. Um, if you notice the other person doing certain body language type things, it can it can indicate to you how you're doing. If uh, if they cross their arms, if they look away, if they sigh, if they shrug their shoulders, uh, each of these things means something, and you can use this to help you understand how better to communicate with them. If somebody um, shrugs when they're saying something, what they're saying is, I don't really believe this, or I can't really justify this, but I'm saying it anyway. Um, if somebody crosses their arms, I mean, they could be cold, so keep that in mind if you're outside, but they could be saying that I'm, I'm feeling defensive right now, I feel like I'm being attacked, um, so back off a little bit. Um, just stuff like that, and it just takes practice, but the main thing is just pay attention to that. It's something that we don't really consciously notice usually, um, but if you if you do consciously notice it, then it's, it's useful to you. Um, this head tilt thing that I mentioned. So when somebody is saying something that you don't agree with, but you want to indicate that you're listening, uh, naturally we tend to, at least in the United States uh, and, and quote unquote Western culture, we nod our heads up and down. And that indicates that we are listening. It also indicates that we agree with you, which you might not want to indicate. If the latter is the case, um, then you can tilt your head to the side that shows that you're paying attention because you're reacting to what they're saying, but you're not nodding. And I, I do that a lot. Uh, it's very useful. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into much scripture in this. It's not, I mean, there's a place for it, but it, I don't want to do that. Um, there is one that I want you to know and memorize the number, 1 Peter 3.15. Uh, it's very, very useful. It's worth memorizing. Uh, it reads, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So in other words, if somebody starts to get worked up or pissed off or uh, angry at you, um, remind them carefully and, and nicely that the Bible uh, commands them, or um, if you want to use a softer word, um, the Bible wants you to uh, be gentle and respectful when you're talking to non-believers. And uh, if they don't want to talk to you, if they, if they get um, a fight or flight response and they just they want to be left alone, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, don't, don't harass them, don't chase them, but uh, make sure that they understand that the Bible tells, uh, assuming, you know, we're talking about Christians or Mormons here, people who follow the New Testament, um, that the Bible tells them explicitly to always give answers to people who ask you to give your reasons. So 
it, it's something that they should not only be prepared to do, but be willing to do, even when they don't want to. Um, okay. There's this argument that one-on-one -on -one is a waste of time. That is false. One-on-one -on -one arguments uh, are not a waste of time. Um, this is how you get through to people. There's a reason that missionaries go door to door. It's it's not a good use of I mean of resources as far as the, I mean they know that churches know that they can reach many more people through the internet than by going door to door and through mega church sermons than by going door to door. But the reason that they do it is because it really really works when you can directly interact with somebody and answer their questions and give them resources to go look up later and stuff like that, you can really help change their mind. Um, many, many people that I know and myself included have had our minds changed about major life decisions by having somebody simply explain it to us and, and in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, obviously, you know, you don't need to dedicate hours and hours that you don't have to doing this, but if somebody is really interested and you have time, um, don't think that it's not worth it just because you don't have an audience that is additionally benefiting from your discussion. The last thing is uh, offer further resources. Um, you're, you're not going to convince somebody in one discussion. That very rarely happens. Um, and they're probably not going to believe everything that you told them anyway. So what you want to do is offer them links, offer them uh, titles of books that they can go look up, um, offer them names of, uh, you know, if, if you're on a university campus or something, offer names of professors that they should, might want to go talk to and ask about this if they're particularly uh, knowledgeable about it. Um, and the other thing is get that person's contact information so you can follow up. Um, a lot of people, the reason that they think one-on-one -on -one is a waste of time is because they don't see what happens because it doesn't happen right then. If it takes six months or if it takes five years for somebody to go through that journey of being a young earth creationist to being uh, an old earth creationist to being, you know, a, uh, a, a evolution accepting Christian to being a cafeterian to being a deist and then finally to being an atheist, um, if, you're not, if you're not following up and you're not talking to them through this whole process, you're going to think that it was a waste of time, but it's usually not. It, you, it just takes a while. So um, stay in touch with them. Okay. Um, advice on uh, discussing these things. Um, don't bring up an argument unless you know it pretty well. Obviously, if if they bring up an argument and it's something they want to talk about, then you know you're kind of stuck. Uh, and that's that's okay. I mean, there's really only about a dozen different things that you need to know in order to have a, a successful discussion about atheism or religion with another person. Um, I'm frequently told uh, when I'm doing discussions with people like, wow, you know so much about everything. And it's like, well, no, it's just that there's only about a dozen of these arguments and I've memorized the answers to them. I mean... Atheists, religionists generally, I mean, really all they need to know is their book, and that's it. Uh, and you don't even really need to know that. You, if you're using faith as your reason, um, you can just say, well, I believe it, and that's that. But to be a, an atheist who can justify why they're an atheist, um, you need to know about cosmology, you need to know about evolutionary biology, you need to know about geology, um, you need to know about... I mean, just all sorts of things, uh, ancient history. I mean, the list just goes on. But you don't need to know a ton about each of those. You just need to know what arguments are common that theists use and be able to explain why they're incorrect. Um, and Dave, so, I, yeah. go, uh, I actually have something kind of along those lines. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I have a question from Dominic uh, VFX. He, he said, most positive debates I've had usually end at the personal experience's argument. Is there an effective counterpoint? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, uh, he said, uh, most positive debates I've had usually end at the personal experience's argument. Mm -hmm. Is there an effective counterpoint? Oh, yeah. Um, well, yes. Uh, okay, so personal experience... I think the best way to explain this is just to say that um, our experiences are fallible. Um, if 
if you trust your senses 100%, you're, you're making a mistake in justification. Um, if, uh, if it were true that we could trust our senses 100% to always give us accurate information about how the universe works, I mean, there would be no, no purpose to magic shows. All the fun would be out of it. Um, even if you have multiple eyewitnesses all saying the exact same story, that doesn't mean that what they saw happen actually happened in that way. Uh, I mean, it'll just continue with the, uh, continuing with the magic show example. You can have an entire audience of 100 people who all will testify that they absolutely saw a woman be sawn in half and then put back together. That I mean, they all understand logically that that didn't really happen, but that is what they saw. And uh, if you can explain to them, just because you experienced something doesn't mean it actually happened that way. And really the way that you tell if something happened the way that you're proposing or a different way uh, is just probability statistics. What is the more likely answer? Um, if somebody is claiming that a dead relative talked to them, you say something along the lines of, okay, which is more likely? That all of this stuff is true, that consciousness survives uh, total necrosis of the brain, that consciousness um, can interact with living things, um, that you know it maintains memory beyond death, um, it, I mean, it's just there. There's so many assumptions that must be true in order for what you're claiming to be true, versus the more likely uh, scenarios that uh, you know you were dreaming, you were um, in a just a temporary psychotic break from reality, that uh, you were daydreaming and you are misremembering, um, that you were drugged. Uh, I mean, there are a million natural explanations that are all infinitely more probable than what you're saying. Um, and especially because most personal experiences are um, not shared, as in, like, if you just saw something or you experienced something and nobody else was there to verify it, that should tell you even more that you can't trust it because it's not, it not only is it non-repeatable, but it's a sample size of one also. So, uh, yeah, it's just it's a terrible way to draw a conclusion. Um, anybody who understands the process of science uh, would never ever draw a conclusion like that based on a sample size of one and one uh, iteration of the experiment. That's just not how you draw conclusions like this. Um, and not that that's not evidence. Um, any experience is evidence, but it's not the quantity or quality of evidence that you need to be able to draw a conclusion. Um, so that's that's probably how I would approach it. Uh, and I mean, you might have to get into explaining a little bit about how probability statistics works and what empiricism is and uh, stuff like that. I actually do a whole talk about epistemology and explaining the difference between um, rationalism and empiricism and uh, faith and so on. But that's uh, that's for another time. Um, I hope that helps uh, answer your question. Yeah, that's a that's a good point because like uh, most of the debates that I get into and I start breaking down all the arguments, it, usually that is their last hope and they just, you know, it's the usual, I, I've had this one experience and that's, so, and I usually, I, I usually never have an, an answer besides the fact of, you know, I, well that's just your own personal experience, there's, there's no claim, there's no proof other than the fact of what well, you're making the claim and you're the only one that can back it up. Mm -hmm. So, no, that was good. Uh, I saw that question. That was something I definitely wanted to bring up. Yeah, I think another another quicker way to, uh, to cut to the chase on that one is um, to just explain the difference between uh, saying something positively happened, making a positive claim about an explanation, and then just saying that you don't know what happened. Um, if you experience something that you can't explain, it is perfectly acceptable to say, I don't know what happened. That's that's a fine place to leave things if you don't have evidence that something is a good explanation for that thing. So if, if somebody says, you know, I saw a ghost, and then uh, is, is that really what you're claiming, that you saw a ghost? Because that's saying, that's making a claim. You can just say, I saw something, I don't know what it was. And that is a perfectly reasonable place to leave that statement. 
Um, now, if you want to investigate what it was, and you have evidence that leads you to believe that it, in fact, was a ghost, now you're trying to make a positive claim that you have to justify. But uh, it's, just, I mean, I, I think the easiest way is just to say um, what you really mean to say when you say that you saw your dead grandfather or something is, I saw something and I don't know what it was. And, uh, I mean, that's that's fine. That's the, that's all of science is trying to figure out stuff that we don't know. It's okay. Um I think a, a major difference between religious people and non-religious people often is non-religious people are comfortable not knowing things, and religious people are very uncomfortable not having an answer, even if it's wrong. Um, okay, so as far as okay, so yeah, we talked about not bringing it up an argument unless unless you know it decently. Um, if you don't know the answer to something. Um, it's okay to say that. You can say, I, I don't know how to explain that well, how to break that down and show you why you're wrong. Um, but uh, don't, uh, don't let your conversation partner, therefore, fallaciously uh, conclude that it's, and this is exactly what we were just talking about, conclude that it's something else on that basis. Um, if you're not familiar, the uh, fallacies of appealing to ignorance and appealing to incredulity, they're similar but slightly different. Um, uh, the fallacy of appeal to ignorance is where we were exactly what we were just talking about, where somebody says, I don't know what that was, therefore it was God. Um, that is fallacious. You don't have a positive justification for it being God. The correct answer is, I don't know, you leave it there. A fallacy of incredulity um, it has uh, its roots in the word uh, credo uh, in Latin, which means I believe. Um, so this means that uh, they're saying I, you're giving me a natural explanation for how this could have happened that's more probable than the incredible one that I think happened, but I don't believe you. Um, like, for example, if somebody's making the claim that uh, uh, all of this could not have happened um, on its own and evolved over time and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we couldn't have this huge variety of species uh, unless God did it. And you say, well, actually, we know exactly how this works and it's the process called evolution. We have evidence for it. Um, you know, it's it's well explained. If they say, I just, I can't believe evolution. It's just too far-fetched. It must have been God. That's appeal to incredulity. Um, don't let them do that either. If they don't understand uh, how something how the scientific explanation for something works, that doesn't mean that there isn't a good scientific explanation for how something works um, or that other people don't understand it. That just means that they don't understand it and they just need to be more humble about that. Um, so another piece of discussion advice is, is just simply, and this goes back into what I was saying before about doing uh, using the bulk of your time listening rather than speaking, is asking a lot of questions. Um, you can use something called the Socratic method, uh, which is basically just, it, it's a little more complicated than this, but basically just guiding them to work it out themselves, like I mentioned before. Um, asking why or how do you know that or why, you know, why is this what you believe and letting, letting them answer it. Um, the, the Socrates had a, uh, a nickname of uh, gadfly because he was annoying because he kept asking questions like a two-year-old and um, it, I mean it, it can be annoying if you do it incorrectly but if you are respectful about it and you just keep prompting them uh, to really dig deep uh, deeply into why they believe what they believe rather than what they believe um, they can they can see it for themselves that what they're saying is wrong so this is a, a useful approach um, Keep your voice very even. Um, this this is a, a mixed piece of advice. When you're when you're making an emotional appeal, which has its place, um, you want you want to allow passion to be part of your argument, uh, pathos and, and the classic you know three form thing of it. Um, passion helps people understand that this is important, and um, if you're talking about something like environmentalism or, uh, you know, science education for children or indoctrination for children or something, it's okay to be passionate about it. That's that's part of making a good argument. 
Um, but when you're trying to ask somebody lots of questions like that, if you are, if your voice is not kept even, you will come across as though you're attacking them or just that you're annoying them. And those are two things that you want to avoid. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how to avoid that um, later on. So uh, we mentioned earlier keeping your partner on topic. Um, if they if they start to drift off into a separate argument, that's one thing, but they also might just start to drift off and do a completely different thing altogether, which is fine. I mean, if you start talking about like that, that's one thing. Um, is this still showing? I've got another feed over here, and it's showing the screen, and it looks like it's just showing me. Is it still showing me, or is it showing the, sli the sl uh, slideshow? Hello? Sorry, guys. One second, if you can still hear me, that is. I hope I didn't just get mm -hmm. kicked out of this. Are you still there? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I don't know um, what is happened it, there. Yeah, is it still... It's Yeah, it's not showing the slideshow anymore. Uh, there was a little error thing that came up. I... Uh, <laughs> It just, it, I think we're still going. I think it's still recording. Yeah, yeah it says we're it's, on it's, air. Yeah, it's broadcasting. Okay, sorry about this, folks. Give me just a minute. I'm going to exit out of my slideshow and uh, start the show from the beginning and go back to it. I wonder if mine just shut off the screen share because I didn't touch it for so long. I bet that's what happened. Okay. Can you now see the Galaxy thing when I'm talking? Yeah. OK, good. So we'll start this over. I bet what happened is um, my computer just, uh, if you're on Google Hangouts, which is what you're using to stream this to YouTube, if it'll ask you if you don't, if you don't uh, do anything for a while, are you still there? And I probably just didn't click yes. So OK. Well, we can always, we can always edit this after the fact. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. All right, so let me go back to where we were. Oh, good, it started right there. Okay, so now you can see the slideshow, right? Yes. Great. Okay, so we we had talked about don't bring it up in an argument unless you know it. Be prepared to concede. Don't let your partner commit those fallacies. Socratic method, keep your voice even. Great. Keep your partner on topic. Okay, so we were here. Um, take notes. A lot of people, for some reason, when they're having a discussion about religion, they think it's it's invasive or something to take notes or inappropriate. It's not. If you if you intend to follow up with them, especially, um, it's fine to do this. Uh, you can do it on your phone if you don't have anything to write with or you don't have a computer with you. But if you're talking about something and they have a question that you can't answer, uh, it's perfectly acceptable to to make a note of it to email them later with the answer to that question or um, with a book recommendation that you want to send them or something like that. Um, it, it's it, And also, if um, if you have a blog or something like this or if you have a, a uh, atheist group that you want to talk to about your experience, then you can recreate it um, better. Uh, and if you have multiple discussions with the same person, I know a lot of people who, for example, will have coffee with somebody regularly uh, to talk about religion, then you can pick up where you left off um, instead of starting from scratch. Um, okay, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, following up with additional resources and, uh, and links to things and so on, um, which means that you need their contact information, so make sure that you have that. Okay, so next we're going to talk about um, what a discussion actually looks like. Um, in the corner there, that's a picture of me on the University of Missouri campus. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Brother Jed, the uh, traveling campus preacher, he's in the back there with the uh, the tan vest and the staff. Um, but uh, I was uh, when this picture was taken, he was preaching, and I had, I had been more or less heckling him all day and correcting him when he was saying things that weren't true. And uh, afterward, um, he basically got tired of <laughs> being corrected, and he went and sat down. And a lot of people came over to me to get more information. And we just sat like this for probably four or five hours uh, talking about all of the things that we had brought up. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really fun afternoon. It was informative for, for everybody, I think. Um, OK, so as far as what a discussion looks like, 
uh, and and I I give credit to uh, J T Everhart, uh, the wonderful blogger. At uh, his blog is called What Would J T Do? WWJTD. Uh, if you Google that, um, it's it's definitely worth checking out. But um, he put together this great chart, which I actually don't have in my slideshow. But here's basically what it says. Okay, um, when you start off discussing something with somebody. Uh, you need to know if there's anything that will change their mind. If if there's nothing that will change their mind, um, and by the way, sometimes people will say that even if that's false, but if there's truly nothing that will change their mind, then a one-on-one -on -one discussion is a waste of your time. There are some people who, it's, it's sad, but they really are so far gone, they are so indoctrinated and brainwashed that it's they are never going to change. And uh, as you as you get older and the more time that you spend indoctrinated, our brains, the way that they function, um, they're plastic. They can rewire themselves. But those pathways are reinforced the more you use them. So it's very easy for a, a young child who uh, hasn't had those pathways enforced and doesn't know you know, the rules from, from just what information is being told to them that isn't a rule. It's very easy for them to change what they think. Um, because they don't know any differently and their, their brain hasn't wired that in yet. If you're talking to somebody who's, you know, 70 and who's been practicing their religion for 65 years, uh, you're not necessarily ever, ever going to be able to change their mind no matter how much you talk to them and how, how much you show them that they're incorrect. So um, something to keep in mind. Um, I mentioned this earlier. Um, if, uh, if you show them that one of their reasons is wrong, it's important that they are willing to agree to this, um, to stop using that argument, not just in this discussion, but with everyone in the future ever. Um, and if, you're, if you are honestly and sincerely seeking truth, you should have no problem agreeing to this. Uh, if you are wrong about something, unless the evidence it changes, unless you have new evidence that shows that you might have been right, um, you, you should abandon that argument. That's what logical people do when they find out that they were wrong. So if they're not willing to do that, that, that tells you a lot about their thought process and, uh, and the usefulness of continuing a discussion. Um, do you agree to follow some basic rules for discussion? Um, some basic rules are like um, you discuss um, one claim or one reason that they believe or one question uh, at a time. You don't, you know, machine gun like I was talking about before. Um, that you provide evidence um, for the claims that you're making. Uh, in other words, you don't just say, um, "This is what I believe." Period. That's not a, that's not a justification. That's just a what you believe. Um, two two different things. Um, don't, uh, you know, I, I, I have them agree not to move on um, to a new reason or a new question. Um, if a fact, uh, an alleged fact that they are relying upon um, in their previous claim is shown to be faulty, that the next claim depends on that fact being true. Um, if if that's the case, they need to stop in that line of thinking, um, et cetera. I mean, just the, the basic rules that we all understand having either studied logic or just, or just having conversations that are rational, um, if they're not willing to to go by that, then it's a waste of time. Um, an important point, a discussion is not a sermon or a lecture. That is, they should not be preaching to you and you should not be lecturing them. Um, if, if, the, if the point of this is to seek truth, like I mentioned before, then uh, you should be asking questions, you should be prodding, you should be looking things up. Um, you should not just, I mean, the phrase that I like to use if they start doing this is I say, look, if I wanted somebody to preach to me, I would go to church. And they're better at it than you anyway. That's their job. <laughs> but um, it, it's not its not why you engage in discussions to, to be preached at. Uh, so make sure that they understand that they're wasting their time in that case uh, as well. Um, and follow these rules for yourself too. It's, it's easy once you understand... Um, some of these these logical rules and, and uh, fallacies and things to abuse them, uh, to use them to convince somebody of something um, fallaciously, and that's that's not cool. Um, 
I mean, that's that's something that they do. That they they uh, they misuse arguments to get people to believe things for uh, ulterior motives, and that's that's not something that rational, ethical people do. So um, avoid that. Okay, so um, now we're starting to get into uh, the uh, the fun part of this, I think. Okay, so understanding how belief works. Um, belief versus knowledge, these are not synonymous. Um, religionists will frequently confuse these two and use them as though they are synonymous. They will say something like, I know God exists. That is not a knowledge claim, even though they're, I mean, they might be presenting it that way, but what they really mean is, I believe God exists. It's, it's quite different. Um, if they say, I, I know Jesus resurrected, or um, I know that God loves me, or whatever, those are, those are uh, beliefs that they hold that are not necessarily true. In order for something to count as knowledge, it has to actually be true, and you have to be able to justify it um, in addition to believing it. So uh, I actually uh, I do a one-hour presentation uh, about, about uh, epistemology, about this, um, and if there's interest, I might do another workshop like this talking about that as well. But um, the takeaway from that, uh, the, the too long didn't read of, of uh, that talk, is just uh, because just because somebody believes something, that doesn't make it a fact. That doesn't make it knowledge. Um, so make sure that they understand that when you're talking to somebody. Um, if somebody does claim something uh, on a knowledge basis like that, um, like I know God loves me or something, um, this is a great line. Say that may be your belief, but is it actually true? Uh, and that that gears them toward now they're in justification mode uh, where they have to uh, give reasons for what they believe as opposed to just what they believe. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a, a great uh, question that you should ask uh, as follow-ups to these sorts of things. Um, he phrases it as, how do you know that? I prefer how, why do you believe that? Because that's really what we want to know. Um, it's a belief that we're questioning here. Um, if they're claiming to know something, uh, what they're really saying is that it is a fact of, of nature, that this is really the way the universe is. Um, and that's that's not necessarily something we want to grant when we're having a discussion. So um, this is a really important point, and I, I kind of brought this up already, but religionists will frequently uh, how do I want to say this uh, revert to what they believe rather than explain to you why they believe it um, which they often state as a fact <laughs> um, the uh, the Nobel Prize winner uh, Daniel Kahneman in um, thinking fast and slow which is a wonderful book if you've never read it he talks about how our brains, um, often without uh, our conscious awareness, um, default to answering an easier version of a question rather than addressing the actual question that somebody asked if it's too hard for us to process. Um, that's, that's a fallacy. It's a logical fallacy. It's called a straw man. Um, in this case, the question wasn't what you believe. It's why do you believe that? So if they start saying, well, I believe that uh, you know that Jesus is God, and then you say, "Why do you believe that?" And they say, "Well, um, I, you know, Jesus claimed to be God. Uh, Jesus rose from the dead." That's that's not why. That's uh, I mean, you could you could frame it that way, but they're not saying why they think this is true. They're saying more things that they believe, um, which is that that Jesus actually claimed that that and so on. Um, what they're really doing in that case is they are appealing to the Bible, which is our source for that information, and then the why would be why do they trust the Bible. So the faster you can get to the real uh, the real why and then start breaking that down, the, the easier it is to get through with this. So um, the outsider test for faith, um, John Loftus is, is known for, for this one. Uh, I don't I don't know if this was actually original to him or if he was just the first person to really formalize it but the outsider test for faith uh, is is 
what would it take to convince someone, to convince you if you're talking to someone, what would it take to convince you that any religion is true? Not, not yours, but anyone. Um, if somebody wanted to convince you that a religion is true, what would you need to see? And if somebody can answer that, if they have a consistent standard for what is what makes a religion believable, that is a huge step toward them seeing their religion as just another religion in a sea of religions, which is how they really are, uh, as opposed to the one true religion and all the other religions as myths. Um, it's it's a it's a just a, an enormous shift in the way people are thinking. And it's not easy to get them to do this, to, to use the outsider test for faith. Um, but that makes it a very powerful tool if you can get them to step outside and objectively look at their religion rather than seeing it as, as the one true faith. Um, so in his words, I, I have the quotation written down here. Um, he says, tell believers to examine their faith critically, and most of the time they will say they already do but tell them to subject their own faith to the same level of skepticism they use when examining the other religious faiths they reject, and that will get their attention. A lot of uh, uh, street preachers and people like that are experts in explaining why Islam is false or why Hinduism is false. And, I mean, they've studied this, but when you ask them, well, can you apply that same skepticism? To Christianity, I mean, you're, you're doing such a good job explaining why Islam is false. If you could just turn that inward, you would see that it's the same exact thing. Um, and that's that's what the goal of the outsider test for faith is. So, when you're having a discussion, and I, I mean, e even just the way that people's minds work when we're talking about religion, um, they often their, their justification and their defense is geared toward deism, uh, not their specific religion. Um, most people who are religious are not deists. Uh, they are a specific religion. So if you're not familiar with the term deist, um, if you are, I apologize for covering this, but uh, it's important that we understand the distinction. So a deist is somebody who believes that there is some force that was somehow responsible for starting things off, um, sparking the universe. Uh, deism, uh, I, I understand the definition to exclude um, continual uh, interaction with our universe. In other words, in a deistic universe, there are no miracles because once it's sparked, it's just natural physical laws from there on. Um, and it's not a personal god which means it doesn't have a name, it doesn't have a, a sex or gender, um, it, it's, not, it's not one or many, it's just something that started it. Um, and this is the God that uh, a lot of the scientists who aren't atheists, this is the God that they believe in. It's just something that we haven't figured out yet, um, that we may never be able to figure out, but it, it probably doesn't in their opinion. Um, follow our rules of physics and it's very powerful and that's all we can say about it. That's deism. So the reason this is important is that a lot of religious people, a lot of Christians and so on, when you ask them why do you believe in Christianity, they start telling you why deism must be true. They start saying things like, well this couldn't have all happened by accident. Nothing can't, or something can't come from nothing. Um, uh, they, they say it's just it's too it's too perfectly set up uh, the, the rules of physics um, if if you know the universe if gravity were one percent more or less than it is then the entire universe would have swallowed itself up and you know blah, blah, blah. those are deistic justifications those are not justifications for Christianity and if they believe Christianity then they should be able to defend uh, properly Christianity it just makes sense if you can't defend it then you shouldn't you shouldn't go so far as to believe it. Um, so don't let them get away with that. Um, if somebody is further claiming that very specific uh, beliefs within that religion uh, are so, then it's even easier for you. 
um, because if somebody is saying, like for example, um, if they give you a denomination, um, then then you can break it down even more. Like if they want to say that um, abortion is bad or that you have to be baptized, um, that uh, I mean just whatever, any specific claim like that. Um, make sure that they understand that the more specific they are, the harder it is for them to justify each of those things. Um, I, I mean, one way to do this is to just start asking them specific questions, and you can get as ridiculous as you want, and that's kind of the point. So if they say that you have to be baptized, say, well, do you have to be completely submerged, or do you, is it just you know, water sprinkled over the top of your head okay? And now they have to tell you why they think that. And they've realized pretty quickly that they don't necessarily have a good answer to that. And then you say, okay, well, you know, it, do you, is, it, is it enough to be baptized when you're a baby, or do you have to be baptized when you're old enough to understand it? Do you have to choose to be baptized, or if your parents kind of force you into it and you don't really believe it yourself, does that count? Uh, I mean, stuff like that. Are we back on – oh, no, it just went over for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, it, the, when, you, when you just point out how ridiculous some of these claims are uh, – it becomes really obvious that they're that they're stupid. I mean, it's just they're not true, and that's that's an easy way to do it. Um, so now, assuming we're talking about uh, the Abrahamic religions, which in most of the case that we're going to be doing this, if you guys are in the United States, that's what we'll be dealing with. Um, the Ten Commandments uh, are kind of an easy thing to go for. Um, they're they're in the Old Testament, so this applies to Islam, Mormonism, Christianity, and Judaism. Um, if if you start out by saying, "Well, are the Ten Commandments important?" Virtually every single person who follows the any of those religions I just listed will universally say yes. Um, a good follow-up question is, "Can you list them?" Um, most people will not be able to, and then you can say well, don't you think that that's hypocritical? Don't you think that's important? Uh, I mean, if you're saying that, that these are a key part of your religion, um, you should probably know what they are, right, so that you don't accidentally break them. And then you can also start getting into questions about um, why, uh, why it's set up the way that it is. Like, why didn't God include slavery uh, is something that's forbidden in the Ten Commandments. Why didn't God include um, rape as something that's forbidden in the Ten Commandments? And these are moral questions that we should be dealing with because we all know now that those things are immoral. Um, so does that mean we're more moral than God? Because remember, the Ten Commandments were written by God. Uh, he handed them down directly in his handwriting, not in Moses' handwriting. He gave those tablets to Moses. Uh, so this is direct from him, no room for uh, interpretation here. Um, and if he didn't mention it, that means that he didn't think it was in the top ten. So that's something we really need to ask ourselves. Um, by the way, um, the Ten Commandments are um, have no other gods before me, two is no carved images, three is don't use my name in vain, four is honor the Sabbath, five is honor your parents, Six is don't kill, seven is don't commit adultery, eight is don't steal, nine is don't commit perjury, and ten is don't covet what your neighbor has. Um, it's worth it for you to memorize that list uh, so that when you're having off-the-cuff discussions like this, um, you know if they get it wrong and you can help plod through them and examine if they really are the ten most important things um, when you're having this discussion. Um, do we have a question or did it just flip over your screen? Uh, I do. I do have a handful of questions. Yeah, sure. Let's cut in. Um, just trying to. Let's see. Uh, kind of, kind of on the topic at hand. Uh, how do you? This is from Secular Dad. How do you handle debates when the opposition doesn't understand who the burden of proof lies upon? Okay, that's that's just a straightforward logical fallacy. And you, um, right. I mean, yeah, you just you explain that this is something that is uh, a formal fallacy. That this is. Um, well, well understood and agreed upon in in, in logic, uh, it has a, a name. Um, the the uh, shifting, the attempting to shift the burden of proof, it's called. And when you do that, you're you're not being logical. Um, and if they agree with you that their uh, their argument has to be has to make sense, then they should abandon that on that reason. Um, 
yeah, I mean, it's just if they if they if they are not okay with the idea that their argument has to be logical, that's a bigger problem. But it's just you just tell them that's fallacious. Uh, it's the logical fallacy of attempting to shift the burden of proof. The party that's making the positive claim has the burden of proof. The party that's saying I'm not so sure about that um, does not have the burden of proving it. You said uh, there were a couple more. Uh, yeah, here's another one. I'd... How might we handle people who are actually looking for both discussion and offense? And he put in parentheses, um, like aggressive young Muslims. This is from God doesn't. Okay, so I mean, if if somebody wants wants aggression, um, it you have to be careful. Uh, I mean, you you don't necessarily know where that's going to go. Um, with a discussion, it's understood that the the goal is seeking uh, knowledge and and discovering truth about the universe. Um, if somebody is seeking a, aggression from you or a, a fight, um, that is a less clear goal, and their their goal might be uh, to change your mind, but it might be to hurt you. And uh, if you're not if you're not absolutely certain about what they're hoping to accomplish with this, I would just ask them. I would say, you know, it, it seems it seems like we're not focusing on getting to the bottom of this. Um, what are you hoping to get out of this that that we'll know that we've reached our goal when we do that? Um, that's that's what I would do at least. Right. Uh, it's kind of kind of going along with your one of your previous slides where you were saying be kind. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I want to touch on that as well. It's uh, when, when you are having this one-on-one -on -one discussion, people realize that it's not necessarily when you're having that discussion with that particular person that you you may not be planning a seat of doubt in them, but there might be someone that's listening or paying attention or even on like online watching the actual debate that might be on the fence or just a new atheist. If we can set the example of proper debating techniques, what to say, what not to say, and I think it's really, you see more of, I mean, it's both sides, but you see more atheists really debating with an aggressive, attacking tone. And um, I think it's important to really push that, being kind, being polite, because uh, I, I have the philosophy of kindness kills. <laughs> yeah, that, that's understandable. Um, I do want to, because a couple people had asked me about this on Twitter earlier, um, and on the, and on uh, American Atheists um, Facebook page too, um, asking or wondering if American Atheists is going accommodationist or going soft. Uh, I want to be absolutely clear that um, there's a a very important distinction between attacking somebody and being straightforward with them. I have zero problem pissing people off um, if if they are getting pissed off for no good reason. If I am just straightforward with them and I'm honest with them. It's it's not my fault if they get defended. Uh, I mean, there are there are certain things that I can do with knowledge of psychology and anthropology and so on to help stop that from happening or, or help stave it off at least. But um, ultimately, you should you should be honest with people. You should be direct with people. You should not beat around the bush. We're not doing anybody favors by pretending uh, that things are not a problem. Um, or by, or you know, saying, well, you believe what you believe, and I'll believe what I believe, and blah blah blah. Um, if somebody is is causing uh, harm um, by believing things that are not true, either um, directly or uh, in a, in a structurally violent way, that's something that we should stand up to. Um, I'm not advocating with this talk, despite the the title of not pissing people off, that we don't piss people off. Um, the, the point of this is to say this is how people get pissed off during debates and during discussions. This is important information because you need to be able to control uh, when that happens if you are not doing it intentionally or if you are doing it intentionally. Um, there are certain situations where you might want to do that and certain situations where you might not want to do that. Um, and I, I don't really consider it manipulative. I consider it just uh, knowledge that that is important to know when you're going through this process of getting to the bottom of what's true. In the same way that uh, if um, if you're if you're trying to avoid getting cancer, uh, you need to understand 
what causes cancer. You need to understand that smoking causes cancer, that radiation causes cancer, and so on. Um, it's not it's not like it's manipulative for doctors to study what causes cancer just because they treat cancer. That's something that they need to know. And similarly, our our goal, even though our goal is not to piss people off, um, we we need to understand how people get pissed off, what causes people to get pissed off, uh, if we're going to have productive, efficient, uh, and effective debates and discussions. So that's that's the purpose of this, which I probably should have said at the beginning. Right, uh, right. I yeah. think uh, I think when a lot of people read the title, they kind of read it as uh, we're walking on eggshells. So yeah, th we're yeah. not. I yeah. I exactly. I agree. Um, yeah. You, you walk on eggshells with people you're afraid of. I am not afraid of any religionist. I will tell any Islam to his face that Muhammad was a pedophile and that anybody who looks up to him is a piece of dirt. And I, that's absolutely what I believe, and I have no problem saying it. I'm not afraid of religionists. I just The reason that I, it's important to understand what pisses people off is so that we don't do it on accident, not that we... Uh, that we don't do it at all necessarily. Right, so, right. It's no yeah. different when they say things like, uh, "Oh, you're an atheist, so you worship Satan." I mean, it's it is stupid, but it does get to you know under our skin to a point because it's like we, we we don't worship something we don't believe in. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can't we can't stress that enough. <laughs> right. And I, I wasn't intending, by the way, anybody listening to pick on Islam. Um, I will say exactly the same type of thing with regard to Christianity or Mormonism or Hinduism or Buddhism oh, yeah. or anything else. Yeah, just just to make that clear. Yeah, the Bible's got what incest and rape and all those. Yeah, I mean slavery too. Yeah, yeah, all sorts of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so um, continue on then. Um, this is um, this is something else that that people just the the way that people's brains look at religion. Um, that when indoctrination happens, they they mix belief with identity, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But um, they they start to see their holy book as the holy book, which is uh, the source. You know, they'll they'll say it's like the source of this stuff. This is God's word. You hear that phrase? Um, that's I mean, it's an, it's an important tool to be able to help someone understand. That their their holy book is a holy book, not the holy book. Uh, they believe their holy book is factual for exactly the same reasons that people who follow other religions believe that their holy books are factual. And if you can help somebody step back and look at it that way, uh, it's a huge step toward them uh, understanding that they are believing their religion, not that their religion is true, which are two different things. Um, so I mean. An easy way to approach this is just to ask, well, I mean, why don't you think that the Quran is true? What is different about the Quran um, versus the Bible that makes you accept one and and flat out reject the other as fact? Um, is is there something specific that makes you say, I know this is false? Um, and if they are not applying the same standard, then they're violating that outsider test for faith. And if they don't know because they've never read it or studied it. Then you can say, well, then you, I mean, they're they're not giving it a fair shake even, and they can't say that the other one is false. They're not they're not even in a position to make that claim. Um, so, I want to talk for a second about parsimony, um, or uh, parsimony if you're British. Uh, this is a this is a very important concept in um, logic and in science. I would argue that this is perhaps the most important concept in the philosophy of science and in, in how empiricism works. Um, it's parsimony is um, it's using economy in your reasoning. Um, this is also uh, it, it, this idea was formalized in I think 1327 by William of Ockham. Um, it's, it basically says the simplest explanation tends to be right. Not necessarily is right, but unless you have evidence that it's more complicated than it, than it possibly could be, then it's probably the, the simplest explanation you can come up with. Um, now, remember, in, 
in history, um, when we're talking about claims about things that happened in the past, and it's, whether we're talking 2,000 years ago or yesterday or this morning, um, we can only rely on evidence. We can't prove stuff like that. It's, it's not amenable to repeat experiment. Uh, and um, we don't, you don't prove things in, in, in this way in, in, in under the system of empiricism. You just provide evidence for things. Um, and the more evidence you have and the better evidence you have, the, the more confident you can be in your conclusion. But you, you never prove things 100%. That's just not how empiricism works. So um, granting that the, the reasonable thing to do uh, is go with the simplest explanation um, unless you have really, really good reason to think that it's actually more complicated than that, um, then we should always default to the simplest explanation. Um, and a, a good example of, of this that I, I like to use is um, explaining um, why Mormonism is less likely to be true than Christianity. And the reason is pretty simple. Mormonism makes all the claims that Christianity makes plus a bunch of other crazy stuff on top of the claims that Christianity makes. So in order for Mormonism to be true, Christianity has to be true plus the things that Mormons believe. It's the same reason that Christianity is less likely to be true than Judaism. In order for Christianity to be true, everything that the Jews believe has to be true as far as God existing, as far as um, you know, the, the Genesis story of the uh, Adam and Eve and all of that and blah, 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 that a Messiah is coming. Uh, the only difference is that Christians believe that Jesus was that Messiah and then all the stuff about being resurrected and, you know, all the other stuff the New Testament says. Um, so, again, Christianity less likely to be true than Judaism because Christianity is everything that Judaism is plus a bunch of other unlikely stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's parsimony. It's very, very important. Um, when we're talking about miracle claims, which will come up uh, frequently when you're having these discussions with people, miracle claims are often what really convinces people that religion is true. Um, some people really are, or at least they've convinced themselves, that they believe a religion based on the evidence alone. Um, or because they've studied a book and they just believe what it says is... Uh, is factual, but many, many people who believe a religion believe it because they have had some kind of experience uh, that was emotional for them, um, that convinced them that this is true. Uh, what, and and we, we touched on this earlier, somebody had a question about it. Um, if somebody tries to make that claim, just give them examples of similar miracle claims from people who are other religions. Uh, for example, in India, there are hundreds and hundreds of claims daily in newspapers about miracle faith healings, uh, and these people conclude that therefore the Hindu gods are real. That is just as unreasonable as experiencing a miracle yourself and concluding that the Christian system is true. Uh, it, one does not lead to the other just because you can't explain something that happened and you will default to whatever religion you were raised in or whatever religion you're most familiar with as the answer to that uh, to the answer to the question of how this happened or what's the explanation for this it doesn't mean that it's a fact so if they if they cannot give you a better reason for why it was the Christian God versus why it was the Hindu God or something else um, then they're being inconsistent so I mean if somebody tries to say well um, you know, I, uh, I had a car accident and, um, you know, two people died and I was the only person who walked away and I didn't have a scratch and God must exist because God saved me. You say, how do you know it was God? How do you know it wasn't Ganesh? How do you know it wasn't Brahma? I mean, you're just saying that it was, your, you know, Yahweh. How do you know that? You have no way of knowing that. You're just making that claim. Um, and then they can back off and say, okay, well, something made sure. And then now they're talking deism, or excuse me, theism, not Christianity, which is a step in the right direction. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is belief versus identity. And I brought this up earlier, but uh, and credit for this, by the way, goes to Greta Christina, um, who, who explained to me very well um, the difference between these and why it's important. So similar to the way that LGBTQ people 
strongly identify with the belief that gay marriage is an acceptable practice, that people should be allowed to, uh, I mean, you know, uh, as far as um, social norms, people should be allowed to be in relationships with the person that they love, regardless of gender identity. Those are beliefs, but people who are LGBTQ especially uh, also identify with that as part of who they are. It's not just what they believe. So when you start trying to have a discussion um, using some kind of ethical argument or something or, or you know, uh, any argument to try to say why gay people should not have to get married, they're going to take it personally because it is part of their identity. It's not just something that they believe. It's also who they are. So they are not necessarily going to be able to just discuss it with you and say, well, actually, here's why that's fallacious and blah, 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 because you're, you are attacking them. You're attacking who, who they are and who they identify as. The same thing is true with religious people. They are not able, until you point this out to them, uh, or unless they've thought it through thoroughly, they are not able to dissociate their belief from who they are. So when you start breaking down Christianity as though it's just some other religion among many, you are, in their minds, attacking who they are, not just what they believe. Uh, it is only after they begin to see Christianity as one among many religions that they can really start to question it. Um, if they still see it as the one true religion and that they are a Christian, it's going to be much, much more difficult to make progress there. Um, an easy way by the way, around causing this to happen, uh, that is emotions to run high when you're making this distinction, is to tell the person directly, I am not criticizing you, I am not attacking you, I am questioning the belief that you hold and I want to talk about that. If you prepare somebody in that way and you, and you delineate what you really mean to say versus what they think you might be saying, uh, it can save a lot of headache. So, um, I actually, <laughs> I do another talk about blasphemy, um, and I'm, I'm going to speed this up a little bit, but um, I'm going to go ahead and make the assertion that the most important difference between theists and non-theists in terms of discussing religion is the idea that blasphemy is a thing. Um, blasphemy is not a concept that exists in a metaphysically natural worldview. There is nothing sacred about anything if you don't have the concept of God. Um, it's just not there. There are things that are valuable, that are things that have moral value, um, life and things like that, but it's sacred is a, is a different category altogether. Um, Blasphemy, the definition uh, is from Merriam-Webster's Third New International on a bridge, um, is the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for a god or a sacred thing. So again, you have to have a god in, in your belief system or you have to have sacred things, things um, that, that a god values in order to have blasphemy. Um, so really, blasphemy, at, at least under Abrahamic law, uh, which is uh, the foundation for, uh, again, Christianity and Islam. Um, blasphemy is really at the root of the entire thing. Um, it's, uh, we talked before about the Ten Commandments. Um, I'd say, really, like, honestly, all of them, all ten of them, are based on this idea of blasphemy, on the idea that some things are sacred and you are not supposed to violate that. Um, the, I mean, the no other gods before me one, that's obvious, um, don't have any graven images. Um, why would that matter? Just it's A graven image just means a carving of something. Um, the only reason that that would matter is if a god is offended by this. Um, don't use God's name in vain. That's pretty obvious. The Sabbath is holy. It says it right in it. Um, honor your parents. Um, that's, that's just good advice. But, uh, I mean, the reason that this is in the Ten Commandments as opposed to just advice is that God is saying this relationship is a sacred relationship and by the way if you don't respect that I'm ordering the community to stone you to death. Um, 
number six would be don't kill, which, uh, I mean, it's because life is sacred, not just because life has value. Um, don't commit adultery. Um, the bonds of marriage, I hate that phrase, but uh, marriage is a sacred thing in in religious tradition, and uh, it's, it's a religious violation uh, to get divorced or to enter into an adulterous relationship or something. Um, it's not not just immoral the way that religious people see it. Um, don't steal, again, just good advice for living in a, in a society, but uh, it's because uh, respecting other people's property rights um, is a sacred thing in uh, Jewish law. Um, not bearing false witness, um, I, again, I mean, it's, it's just because it's in the Ten Commandments, I would say that's uh, evidence that it's it's something that's important to God personally. Um, and then don't covet, again, um, it goes along the same thing with respecting your neighbor's property and respecting uh, marriage. So let's see. Yeah, I talked about, okay, it's, it's the foundation of Jewish law, um, of the, the myth of Jesus' uh, his whole story, um, and Islamic law. Um, in, uh, let's see, it was Matthew um, 26, 63, Caliphus. Um, this is, uh, okay, what's going on here? Um, Jesus, the reason that he was hated by the Jews, the reason that he was executed, um, people were, were, there was a rumor that he had claimed to be the Messiah, which is like, whoa, you're not supposed to do that. Claiming to be the Messiah is a sacred claim and you can be executed for that. Um, so they brought Jesus before Caliphus um, and uh, the high priest said, uh, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said, yes, it is as you say. Um, and he says, but I say to all of you in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Uh, in response to this, the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do, you, why do we need any more witnesses? Uh, look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they said back, he's worthy of death. Um, I mean, just, just claiming that he was the Messiah, that's what got him killed. That's why they took him to, uh, to, to Pilate to be executed. Um, it's, it's foundational to Christianity. Um, there's this, uh, I'm, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Um, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is what's called an eternal sin. Um, you can be forgiven in Christianity, or at least in Catholicism. This is a little different for, depending on your denomination. Um, for any sin uh, by repenting and asking for Jesus to forgive you, uh, except denying the Holy Spirit once you've been exposed to the idea of the Holy Spirit. If you've never heard of Christianity, then you're not going to hell for not being a Christian necessarily. Um, but if uh, you have heard of Christianity and you just reject the Holy Spirit, you can never be forgiven for that. So in other words, all, all, all American atheists, everybody who's in this country who's aware of Christianity is not one. Uh, we're going to hell under Christianity. Um, so the reason that I'm bringing this up is because, um, oh, yes, and in Christianity and in Islam, uh, just doubting, I mean, it's a thought crime, just doubting that your religion is true is blasphemous. Um, okay. So the reason that I bring this up is because something happens in people's brains um, when they are offended, um, and people who have an, a religious identity, this happens when you blaspheme. So it's very important that you understand what constitutes blasphemy and uh, the rules that they follow that they think um, apply to this, even if you don't think they apply, um, if you're trying to understand what will cause this in another person. So there's this thing, it's called amygdala hijacking. Uh, Daniel Goleman, who's a uh, psychologist over at Harvard, and Joseph Ledoux, who's a neuroscientist here at NYU, um, they they wrote 
two books. Uh, well, Daniel Goleman wrote one, and Joseph Ledoux wrote the other. The the Goleman book is called Emotional Intelligence, um, and uh, the Ledoux book is called Synaptic Self. These are fascinating books that I highly recommend. Um, but uh, Goleman, uh, building off research in Synaptic Self from uh, Ledoux, uh, coined this phrase called amygdala hijacking. And um, I'm, I'm going to go through here on the next slide the the, neurolo the, uh, the the process of exactly what happens as far as the patterns in your brain. Um, but I'm first going to describe what this is. So there are three signs that you are looking at a case of amygdala hijacking. Sorry, one second. I have to fix something on my computer. OK. Um, the first sign is if they have a strong emotional reaction to what you're saying or what just happened or what they just witnessed or whatever it is. Um, the second one is that it happens very suddenly. It's, it's not something that they build up to. The third one is that afterward, they realize that they overreacted. Um, that is, if you have all three of those, um, a good chance you're looking at what's called amygdala hijacking, that that's what happened. Um, Surprise plays a crucial role in amygdala hijacking. This is why it's so important to prepare the person that you're talking to before you say something that's going to offend them. If they know it's coming, they are not going to go into this fight or flight mode if they are prepared for it. Um, it if uh, it's like, OK, there's this phrase, um, the secret to humor is surprise. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny, but I mean, it's it's the same thing here. If you if you flip that around, um, when you're trying not to trigger this reaction, uh, you can do the same thing by preparing them for it rather than surprising them on purpose. Um, so I want to talk about uh, desensitization and uh, parallels to how phobias are treated, um, which is uh, surprisingly relevant to to this process. So. Desensitization, if you're familiar uh, with uh, Victor Klein, um, he's, a, he's a pretty famous guy. Uh, he's at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, he's a psychologist, and um, uh, he testifies in court as an expert witness a lot on stuff like uh, video game violence, um, sex addiction. Uh, he does a ton of studies about uh, pornography use and things like that. Um, um, his... Uh, his research is it's fascinating. I recommend that you look it up. Victor Klein, again, his name is. But he's, he's discovered that the more you are exposed to something, the less effect it has on you. And basically, the more tolerance you have for it, um, the higher uh, you have to, the, the more um, egregious something has to be to, to have that same triggering effect on you. Um, in other words, if, if you are very, very sheltered, and you've never seen porn before in your life, it's going to very much shock you. Um, versus if you work in porn, if you know, you're know you a cameraman or something, I mean, you're, it, it, you see it every day. It means nothing to you. You're not going to respond to it. Um, this is something, actually, that we deal with here personally sometimes. Not, not the porn part, um, but I was going to say at the American Atheist's office, um, we hear stories all the time of people being mistreated, of being... Um, discriminated against, uh, I mean, things that, that are bad, that we are unhappy about, that we want to fix. But um, sometimes uh, we have to kind of remind ourselves that um, we are not necessarily as deeply affected by some of these things as we used to be, because we've seen them before. Um, it's, it's very important that you maintain your passion when you're doing activism work like this. Um, there's kind of a tendency for us to say, like, oh, I've, I've seen worse than that. You know, why, I mean, it, why is this a big deal? But it is a big deal. It's a big deal to that person, and it's a big deal anyway. Um, it's, you know, discrimination is wrong no matter how subtle uh, or common. That's, that's just a fact. Um, but it's, it's something that we have to keep in mind when we're talking to people who call us or email us or write to us about an experience that they've had, um, that these things still matter. Uh, even if we've seen them, you know, 10 times that day. So, okay. Um, talking about phobia treatment, um, you can systematically treat phobia. Uh, 
I'm, I'm going to use um, arachnophobia for this example. Uh, this guy, Joseph Wolpe, um, in uh, the 1950s, made huge advances in clinical treatment of phobias, uh, uh, which was not really something that there was an effective treatment for before the 1950s, um, by developing this 13-step uh, process. Um, so basically, if you have arachnophobia, which is just a, a irrational fear of spiders, that is, uh, by irrational fear, I mean that you are afraid of them above and beyond their actual danger to you. Um, this, the first step in this 13-step process is uh, in, a, in a controlled, calm situation like a clinician's office, uh, you think of a spider. And for some people, this is enough to freak them out. Um, they don't like thinking about spiders. They will avoid it. They will repress memories of it. Uh, it's, it's just uncomfortable for them. Um, but you start off by doing that. And once you are comfortable, once you don't freak out, um, once you can do it at will and, and be okay with thinking about spiders, then you look at a cartoon or a silly drawing of a spider. And once you can do that without freaking out, then you look at a realistic drawing of a spider. Then once you can do that without freaking out, you look at a photo of a spider. And once you can do that without freaking out, then you look at a real empty spider's web. Then once you can do that without freaking out, you touch a spider's web. Then once you can do that without freaking out, you look at a real spider in a box, not holding the box, but just looking at it in a box. Once you can do that without freaking out, then you hold the box with the spider in it. Once you can do that without freaking out, then you take the spider out of the box and put it across the room and you look at it. And once you can do that without freaking out, then you put it halfway across the room. Once you can do that without freaking out, you put it up close to you. Then once you can do that without freaking out, you let it crawl on something you are holding. And the 13th step is you let it crawl on your hand. And by the time you let it you are comfortable letting it crawl in your hand, you are cured of your phobia. And the same thing is true with um, what we're talking about here with blasphemy. For an atheist, um, we are accustomed to criticizing religion, to talking about how absurd and ridiculous it is, to, talking, to saying phrases like Muhammad was a pedophile. Um, that doesn't shock us because we know it already. Um, for somebody who is not accustomed to hearing that, um, there was an episode uh, at Skepticon 4, I believe it was. Uh, Sam Singleton, if you know who he is, he has he's a, a comedian. Sam Singleton is a character that he plays who's a preacher. Um, and he, he does this whole, like, fake sermon uh, where, you know, he dresses up and um, and he, it's, he basically is making fun of religion instead of saying um, amen. He says God damn and stuff like that. Um, so what happened at Skepticon, he was doing his performance and uh, somebody who owned a ice cream shop next door wandered in just because he knew there was a, a conference going on. He wanted to see what it was. And he saw Sam Singleton doing this thing and just trashing religion. And this guy got very, very upset. He went back to his shop. He put a sign in the window that said uh, something along to the effect of atheists are not welcome at my Christian business um, because it upset him so much. And, I mean, it, it was making us laugh because, you know, it just we're, we don't see it as something uh, blasphemous like that. Um, but, there, I mean, I know many, many Christians who would not see that as something to freak out about because they are accustomed to being to having their religion made fun of and it doesn't bother them. Um, so the reason that, that I'm saying all of this, um, the more that you can desensitize somebody, the more that they are familiar with this type of stuff, uh, the less amygdala hijacking will happen. So let's talk about what amygdala hijacking is. This is uh, a side view um, of a human brain. So and I'm hoping you guys can see my mouse cursor. Um, if not, I apologize. But OK, so the way that this normally works, you've got your, uh, your input. It comes in through one of your senses, your eye, your ear, whatever. And it goes to the thalamus first. The thalamus is uh, kind of like the, um, oh, how to put it, uh, the 
air traffic control center of the brain. It's the one that routes signals to different parts of the brain for further processing. It does some other stuff too. Um, but for what we're talking about right now, that's what's relevant. So what normally happens with uh, the way that your brain processes input, um, st a stimulus comes into the brain, it goes to the thalamus, then it goes to the occipital lobe. If it's from your eye, that is the part of your brain that processes visual input. Then it goes from there to the amygdala for uh, emotional processing. That is, it adds um, em emotional uh, layering on top of that input so you know how to respond to it. Um, so that's, that's the normal flow of how this works. Um, and then, uh, okay, so with uh, amygdala hijacking, what happens, you can see down here, uh, stimulus, thalamus, occipital lobe, amygdala, and then your emotional response. Um, so with amygdala hijacking, what happens is your stimulus comes in, say you see something that's uh, blasphemous, something like, um, uh, you know, there was that famous piece of artwork of um, a, l a little statuette of Jesus in a jar of, of human urine. Um, so if somebody religious sees that, it goes into their brain, it goes to the thalamus, thalamus realizes that this is upsetting and sends it to, instead of the occipital lobe for processing, sends that signal straight to the amygdala. This is why it's called amygdala hijacking. And so what that means is that you get stimulus, air traffic control, the amygdala adds the emotional response. Now the amygdala is the part that can trigger the fight or flight response. So it's important to keep in mind here, at no point in this cycle is the occipital lobe, uh, the neocortex, the part of your brain that does um, language processing, the part of your brain that does logical thinking, the, the outer part of your brain. Um, remember, brains evolved from the inside out. Our lizard brain is at the core. Um, things like fish, you know, might even just have the brain stem. It's a little different than that. but. Um, this, this is the primal, oldest part of the brain. What makes us different from other animals as far as the fact that we are quote-unquote advanced, we've had the same amount of time to evolve, but um, is that we have this. We have this neocortex that can do all of these amazing things that make us different. In this situation of amygdala hijacking, none of this is involved in the process. It's just not even, it's not even part of it. In other words, uh, when you're coming back here for processing, you are adding all sorts of, of uh, understanding of what's going on. Um, when you go here, uh, I mean, you're not, you're not physically capable of processing this logically. You are not physically capable of making a good judgment about it. The um, ventral medial prefrontal cortex that's in this area um, that does risk reward ratios uh, is not, is not um, what's the word, um, consulted <laughs> in this process. Um, the, re the reason is, I mean, just the, the blood flow and, and the neurological activity does not go there. Um, so you don't even have a chance to talk to somebody rationally when this happens. Uh, they freak out and their, their brain literally does not process things on a logical level um, when you do this. And different sorts of things can trigger this. And there are things that um, you might not necessarily think of really um, uh, as, as something that would if you are desensitized to it. Um, as far as, um, as what this looks like, okay, I've, I've got some quotes that I wrote down here. A Goldman says, um, emotions make us pay attention right now, this is urgent and give us an immediate action plan without having to think twice. The emotional component involved, excuse me, evolved very early. Do I eat it or does it eat me? Uh, the emotional, this is from uh, Shell Horowitz uh, from his book, Emotional Intelligence. Uh, the emotional response can take over the rest of the brain in a millisecond if threatened. Um, the this amygdala hijacking process, uh, it triggers a release of um, peptides and, and hormones. Um, the, the most well-known one is adrenaline, which does all sorts of stuff. It prepares you for violent muscular action. Uh, adrenaline, which is uh, aka epinephrine, um, it speeds up your heart rate, it speeds up your breathing, uh, your, your bronchi dilate, your pupils dilate, your blood vessels and your muscles dilate uh, while constricting blood vessels in, in uh, your extremities. Um, in extreme cases, uh, you uh, it, it even sucks blood flow uh, away from uh, your bowels and you will lose those. 
uh, it's it it everything that it does in this process prepares you to get away as quickly as possible and uh, focus on uh, keeping your core organs going um, and not worrying about anything else because you're in danger. Um, and I mean, obviously, there are different degrees of this depending on how threatened you feel. But the reason that people get so upset uh, if they feel threatened like this is because this is the same process to a lesser degree that kicks in when um, you know a, a shark jumps out of the water at you. It's it's the same thing going on in your brain. Um, you know, when you're when you're swimming and that happens, it, it's scary. Um, so just understand that that's how that that works for somebody. That's what they're, what's going on inside their head. Um, so as far as what this looks like, um, the uh, the key word I mentioned this earlier is just it's being sheltered. You got to remember that the way that uh, the way that this works. It, it, this is at least in America. This isn't true everywhere, but um, we have a system set up here. Uh, for, for Christians, other religions do this too, but I'll, I'll just talk about Christianity. They have their own daycares, they have their own private schools, they have their own textbook publishers, they own their own TV networks and radio stations, they have their own genres of music, their own genres of fiction and uh, questionably nonfiction. Um, they have their own summer camps, um, they have their own colleges, they, they even have their own hospitals. And the, the point that I'm making is that you can go through your whole life as a Christian without really interacting with somebody who isn't a Christian. Um, and that's, that's unfortunate. Um, if you're, if you, because you're not going to be desensitized if that's what happens. If you are always protected from that, uh, you, will, you will go into this amygdala hijacking uh, process the first time that you are, um, because you, you haven't been desensitized to it at all. Um, when I used to uh, to table, um, I mean, I, I still do this, you know, for American atheists now. But um, on my college campus, you know, we had the, an, an atheist campus group, and we would set up a table that said "Ask an Atheist," and people would come up and ask us questions. And it's amazing to me that some people just they get so angry at just the word atheist like it it's just it makes them want to hurt people uh, just to see it on a t-shirt or on a sign just being reminded that atheism is a thing um, freaks them out and the reason that I'm saying this is if you're having a discussion with somebody and you're wearing a t-shirt that says God is imaginary or a t-shirt that says this is what an American atheist looks like or something like that, um, you might not even get a chance to start the conversation. If amygdala hijacking kicks in, even if it's just you know very subtly or uh, not very strongly, um, the conversation could be over before it's even started. Because remember, they are incapable physically of thinking logically and listening to you when this process starts. The, the blood flow does not go to that part of their brain. Um, so, uh, yeah, like I said, just the word atheist can do it um, to extremely sheltered people. Um, you have been uh, desensitized as an atheist who is familiar with this stuff, who has read books about it, who has seen videos, uh, who has been to skeptics conferences, um, and, and has just dealt with this a lot. It's, it doesn't have the same effect on you, so you have to keep in mind um, that you are at a different level of desensitization uh, as the person that you're talking to. Um, and it's, it's a relative uh, process. Um, hold on a second. Uh, the, something that I think is important to keep in mind, um, earlier when I talked about those 13 steps of uh, clinical treatments for phobias, um, you have to do them one at a time. You absolutely cannot skip steps or it doesn't work. If you're starting off with having somebody look at a drawing of a spider and then by the time they get comfortable with that, you skip to having them, you know, hold a box with a real spider, I mean, you just skipped like five steps, you know? 
it's, it's understandable that they're not ready for that and they're going to freak out. So you have to meet them where they are. If you're talking to somebody um, who is barely able to have a conversation with you because your shirt says American Atheists on it, don't start attacking the core things in their religion, um, even though that's valid. Uh, because you're going to end the conversation before you get a chance to, to make any headway. Um, start off slowly and, and build your way up to that. Um, let's see. So yeah, uh, just a couple of things um, to keep in mind. Like I said, be aware of what you're wearing. Um, and I mentioned like t-shirts that say atheist. This is not just that direction, but um, this comes up with uh, uh, Orthodox Jews and with um, certain um, branches of Islam as well. Uh, if you have somebody who's tabling with you, who's a woman and she's wearing shorts, uh, an Orthodox Jew or a Muslim is is not going to be able to engage in conversation because they will be extremely offended uh, because of this is blasphemy and and it's not appropriate. Um, it's it's just something to keep in mind that there's there's different standards. Uh, for different cultures like this and you don't want to shut things down before you have a chance to get going. Um, unfortunately for us this means that we have to study up on what has the potential to cause this in all of these different belief systems. It's just it's a pain um, because it's really not our problem but uh, it is a fact so um, one other thing um, be aware of what you say, and not just the content of what you're saying, but the, uh, the actual words that you use. Uh, cursing is, by many sheltered religious people, seen as hugely uh, n um, inappropriate and, and wrong, immoral, and uh, it, it will shut them down. So um, be careful of what you say. Um, there's, there's actually interesting research that shows that uh, people who use some cursing um, are, are more effective in, in arguments as far as bringing passion into it, but you have to be careful about how you do it. I know a guy, um, he's, he's very, very Christian, uh, who says when he's upset, um, he doesn't even say, uh, I mean, obviously doesn't say goddamn, but he doesn't even say gosh darn or something you know, softened like that. He says, good night, Irene. Like, he yells it out, and that's the phrase that he uses. Or he says, instead of shit, he says sugar shells. It's it's bizarre, but that's what his parents taught him to say um, because they're sheltered like that, and they sheltered him. Um, as far as uh, this uh, God, Yahweh thing, uh, the where it says Yahweh there, um, in Hebrew there's no vowels, so that's how it... it it's transliterated. That's the uh, Tetragrammatron, which is um, God's actual name in Judaism. Um, saying this word, Yahweh, is blasphemous in Judaism. In Under Jewish law, you may not pronounce that word. The name is considered so sacred that ordinary people are, are prohibited from saying it. Uh, the only person who's allowed to say it is the high priest, and you can only do this during services uh, under certain conditions. Um, the, when you're reading books out loud or, um, or writing about this stuff, uh, the correct way to do it, if, you, if you're Jewish, is to say Hashem, which just means the name in, in uh, Hebrew, or Adonai, which means master. Um, they, they use these instead of saying that word. Uh, and the same thing kind of carries over to English. Um, they write it out as G hyphen D instead of saying God. Uh, just uh, the uh, logic behind this, and this is really bizarre, but it's it's considered inappropriate because you never know what is going to happen to, the, to where you wrote it down. Like, for example, um, if you write the word God on a piece of paper, and then at some point in the future that piece of paper is thrown away, that's disrespectful to God. So you're supposed to write G hyphen D so that you, you are certain that it, his, his written name is never disrespected. Um, and they do the same thing when they're typing, I guess, because they, in case the file is ever deleted or something. But it's just something to be aware of. If you have uh, literature that, that you're passing out um, you know, for your atheist group or something and you have the word God written down like that, 
a very, very Jewish person is going to be upset about it and may not be able to really process what the rest of your literature says because they are off put um, by this by just the initial thing that you said. Um, I'm not saying that you should say G hyphen D. That is their problem, not our problem. I just want you to be aware of it. Um, this, uh, where I say book on ground, what I'm talking about there, um, in, uh, in Judaism, and this might be true in Islam too, I'm not exactly sure, um, there's a, a, an important concept in Islam that, uh, or excuse me, in Judaism, that it is disrespectful and blasphemous for the uh, Torah to touch the ground. So if, um, if you accidentally do this, what you're supposed to do is pick it up and kiss it and ask God for forgiveness. Um, it's it's a book. It, it doesn't have feelings. But um, we actually, uh, I ran into this once at a tabling event. Um, a very Jewish person was extremely upset with me for the fact that I had my Bible uh, leaning against the table, the, the leg of the table uh, on the ground. And he wanted me to pick it up. And I said, it's I don't have room on my table. That's why I put it in there in the first place. Um, and, but he was very upset. And it, it's just... It's bizarre, but this is the kind of thing that they that they are working with, and we have to meet them halfway um, if if we want to be effective in this. So, uh, wrapping up um, discussions, um, blasphemy means different things to different people. It is culturally dependent, and it is dependent on how desensitized you are uh, to cause amygdala hijacking in discussion. Um, if this is what you are intending to do, here's how you do it. You challenge your conversation partner directly. Um, you, uh, you make it uncomfortable for them by not meeting them where they are with desensitization. Um, if you want to avoid amygdala hijacking, which you, you may want to do for other reasons, um, use baby steps, the opposite of this, uh, the phobia steps. Um, you avoid surprises by preparing your conversation partner when you're about to say something that they don't, that you anticipate they're not going to want to hear or deal with. Um, reassure your conversation partner throughout. If you notice that they're starting to get upset, you can back off if, if that is not your intention. Um, you can tell them, I know this is upsetting, um, you know, this is an emotional topic. Um, but uh, you know, I think we're making good progress, or I, I'm learning a lot. Or well, I mean, whatever you need to say. Um, and remember that this doesn't happen immediately or overnight. Uh, it takes years, in many cases, for people to go from very religious to atheist. Uh, don't be discouraged because you are not seeing progress in an hour of chatting with somebody. Um, and that, that goes back to what I was saying earlier about uh, getting their contact information and following up. Um, it is effective to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it just takes some time. Very, very rarely will you see somebody deconvert on the spot. I've seen it happen, but it's really, really rare. And it's usually because they were about to anyway, and they just needed some final answers uh, to make that leap. Um, OK. so. That's uh, two hours, and I have more on formal debates, um, but I'm going to go ahead and stop this here, and we can save that for another workshop. Um, David, do we have questions? Yeah, um, I uh, have a handful of questions. Okay, let me let me turn off my slideshow here, and we'll go back to the webcam. Give All me right. a second. <clears throat> So what's the first question? Um, this is from the YouTube comments. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if he wants me to use his name, so I'll just call him Sean. Okay. He said, I'm about to lose a good friend because I'm an atheist. He's oblivious to a lot of basic science and math. Is it more valid for me to politely walk away from the friendship or try to educate? Um, if, you're, if you're about to lose your friend... I mean, I think it, you are in a better position to judge how close you are to that than I am not knowing the specifics of this. Um, I would probably say you should back off uh, 
for now. Um, the baby steps thing is really important. Uh, it's, it's going to take time for him to build up to the level of desensitization where he's ready to hear some of this stuff um, that you have to say. The, the best thing to do, um, we don't, at American Atheists, uh, proselytize. We don't, we don't go out and try to deconvert people. And one of the main reasons is that it doesn't work. Uh, people have to be ready to listen to what you have to say, and they have to want to hear uh, why they're wrong. Um, it's the same reason that uh, groups do ask an atheist tables instead of uh, street preaching. Um, if people come up to you with their questions, it's much more effective. Uh, simply being around your friend and with him knowing that you're an atheist and seeing that, hey, atheists can make moral decisions and have moral behaviors after all, um, helps normalize atheism. Uh, and seeing that the way that you live your life is a successful method um, helps helps people understand when they see this um, that it's a, a good thing to be an atheist and uh, I think if you're just consistent about that I think that'll that'll demonstrate to him in possibly a better way than you could explain anyway yeah I think I think that's a good point is so you you back off and you you just they, he obviously knows you're an atheist mm -hmm. and um, just continue to be the the a good part, like continuing everything that you would normally do, live your normal life, everything like everything like that. And um, if if that is more important to them, to if their faith is more important than the relationship that you have with them, then obviously they weren't a good friend. <clears throat> I uh, I agree. All right, I do have um, another one to kind of touch on. Uh, Atheist Baker. How do you deal with Muslims that claim the Quran predicted science? Um, there's a couple of different ways. So the Quran uh, makes some really vague uh, statements about things that are allegedly going to happen. Um, some of the best things that you can do are basically just show that they're vague. You can make a prediction fit just about anything um, if it's vague enough. Uh, I mean if somebody makes the prediction that at some point in the future um, you know uh, a great leader will emerge it's like that doesn't mean anything and that applies to every country everywhere uh, it's it's not really making any specific claim um, I have heard I think what you're talking about where they say that Islam says that uh, there are um, like uh, that uh, salt water and fresh water don't mix, which is not something that was scientifically known at the time, but Islam knew that. And uh, then later when scientists found out that that's true, then that verifies Islam somehow. Um, that, first of all, there's nothing stopping fresh water and salt water from mixing. That's not true. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of things like that. Um, you can either go about this in one of two ways. I would say you can say uh, all that tells you is that they had information that you don't know how they had it, assuming you're willing to grant that they actually did have this information. It doesn't necessarily mean that God was talking to them. Um, for example, uh, Einstein had information that um, if you are not a mathematician, uh, or a, a theoretical physicist, you're going to not understand how he has how he has this predictive power. Um, that doesn't mean a god did it. Even if he claims that a god did it, that doesn't mean that a god did it. It just means that you don't understand how he was able to do it. That's all it means. Um, the other way to, to approach this is to say, well, uh, in actual fact, those claims that you're making are either too vague or... Uh, not in accordance with reality that they don't count, um, which is, I think, applicable to all of them anyway. Um, so it really just depends on whether you want to grant that they're true or not, uh, how you want to approach it. Right. Yeah, I was curious because, to be 100% honest, I don't think I've ever really been in a debate over uh, Islam. So 
Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that argument. <laughs> yeah, there there's like a whole list. There, if you Google scientific claims from the Quran, you'll you'll find a whole list of stuff like that. They're they're ridiculous. They say and they make the same claims about Christianity uh, and and Judaism too. They'll say, um, like for example, that um, they knew that uh, the Earth was round when scientific thought at the time is that the Earth was flat. That's false. I mean, since nine thousand years ago, we've known that the Earth was spherical. Which, by the way, it doesn't say it was spherical. It says it was round. Um, but I mean, ever since we had seafaring people, if you have a ship that's sailing off into the distance, as it goes over the horizon, uh, the bottom of the ship disappears from sight first, and the mast sinks, and eventually the top of the mast disappears as it goes away from you, because the Earth is curved like that. And then when it comes back towards you, the opposite happens. You see the top of the mast first, and it appears to rise up out of the water, and the last thing that you see appear is the, um, the uh, keel. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we've known that since we started sailing, which was a very, very long time before uh, any of these books were written. I mean, that, that's just a ridiculous claim. Further, the Bible says that the earth is supported by four pillars, which obviously is also false. So, yeah, it's just, it, it doesn't make sense. It's not, it's not actually true anyway. Right, right. Um, all right, well, here's another one. Uh, this is from VNSR2012. She said, morality... Morality is usually theist's last resort to win an argument. How do we reach common ground on morality with theists? Okay, so Phil Zuckerman uh, wrote a great piece about this. If you're not familiar with Phil Zuckerman, he's a sociologist at Pitzer College in California. He wrote a book called Societies Without God. Uh, he did field work in Scandinavia, uh, in uh, Denmark, and... Uh, did he go? I can't remember now. Anyway, uh, he spent 15 months um, basically figuring out what we can learn from the societies on Earth uh, that have the, the least religion and, and how they live their lives. And um, he, he had this article that he basically said, um, don't get into arguments with people about what, uh, what constitutes moral actions, um, but rather... Uh, just just stick to the point that your behavior demonstrates how moral you are. And as atheists or as non-atheists, it doesn't matter. Um, we, we're moral based on what we do, not on what we say we believe or what's written in some book. Um, and on that basis, we can see that the Bible is not moral. We don't practice slavery. We don't subjugate women. We don't treat women as property uh, I mean and we, we find these things morally reprehensible and the reason that we do is because we as humans uh, actually I mean if you want a thorough answer I can give you a much more thorough one um, <laughs> but we've uh, we've evolved well, as doing another hangout on morality oh okay I'll save this for that then because this is a subject <laughs> that I've studied quite a bit um, if you want some book recommendations uh, I'll start with um, The Origins of Virtue by Matt Ridley. Uh, that's probably a good, a good place to start uh, as far as where morality actually came from. It evolved is the simple answer. And it evolved for very good reasons that we have excellent evidence for. It's not really a question in science about how, uh, how morality came about or why we have this concept of morality. Um, every cooperative species, not just humans, has uh, moral concepts, um, not conscious ones. Um, we are the only species with ethics, which is the philosophical study of morality in a prescriptivist sense. But in a descriptivist sense, um, bees and ants and lions and fish and dog packs and any group of animals that works cooperatively has rules that they follow for how they treat each other. Humans are not unique in this. So this idea that God gave morality to humans is absurd and demonstrably false. Um, it evolved for good reasons, um, and it's, it's a survival strategy that, that we have found that other animals found too. Right, right. Um, let's see. 
This is from Atheist RP Girl, and we'll make this the last question, and then uh, let you get your shout outs and all that. Okay. Um, when debating hypocrisy in the Bible, and we give a verse, how do we respond to that's out of context? I would say uh, it kind of kind of depends on the verse, but um, I, I've studied the Bible a lot, so generally when somebody tries to pull that one on me, uh, I can show them that they're wrong. <laughs> but um, uh, I think the basics of it would just be to say, you could counter this with saying, well, how do you know what's the right context and what's not the right context? I mean, you were not the author of this, and any time you're pointing to something in the Bible and trying to claim that this is not what the author intended, you are interpreting what he intended. And then you have to justify how you know that, or rather, why you believe that. And then what you're really saying is, this is my opinion about what this is supposed to mean. And that really means that it's not, it's not worth more than somebody else's opinion, especially if that other person is more informed about this than you are. Um, ultimately, I mean, I've, uh, like, I, like I've mentioned, I've studied the Bible a lot. I, I do several presentations about, about it and its historical reliability and about uh, translation of it, all sorts of things like that. But uh, when the Bible comes up, um, I usually don't even bother getting into that, those arguments because first they have to show me why I should care. If they start quoting the Bible, I say, before we even get into why the Bible is not historically reliable or whatever, or not translated properly, or context or metaphor versus, I mean, that's lower criticism when you're talking about metaphor versus, or, excuse me, um, that is, uh, what's it called? Anyway. That, that doesn't matter until you can show me that I should I should believe what the Bible has to say. In other words, that it's an authority on the subject at hand. Unless you can show me that God uh, inspired these documents or uh, or dictated them in some way, uh, as the Quran claims, um, unless you can provide excellent evidence of that, it doesn't matter what it says. It's just a man-made document, and it, it it's irrelevant. Um, to what's actually historically true or what's actually moral or whatever the claim is about. Right. Uh, exactly. I mean, it's it's so uh, generically written that anyone can uh, take it any, in any context anyways as it is, and it's been translated and different versions and all that. So it, it is what it is, essentially. <laughs> Um, and then one, just one last co uh, comment uh, to to one of your very first slides. They, uh, Magnum DP, DB said, if they think I represent all of atheism, I'll ask them if they represent all of Christianity, Baptist, Catholic, and even Mormon. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an excellent way to put it. Um, I, I mean, nobody should be expected, and this is something that comes up a lot in, in LGBTQ. Uh, stuff as well, where um, you know, if you're talking to somebody who's trans or something, and you, you ask them a question about it, first of all, unless they've invited you to ask questions, that's really rude. But uh, second of all, it's a it's a very diverse group of people, and to to expect that person to be able to represent every single person in that community um, is is not appropriate or fair or or even a good idea if you're trying to get an accurate answer for yourself. Um, there, there's a reason that denominations of, of religions have split off because they believe different things and they approach things in different ways. Um, they take things more or less strictly depending on uh, how important they think they are and, and all sorts of stuff like that. The important thing to remember is that every single religious person believes that he or she is practicing their religion correctly, um, or at least they're trying to. Um, nobody thinks that what they believe is wrong, because if they thought that, they would stop believing it if they're, if they're rational in any way. Um, I saw this great cartoon, and I'm sorry I don't remember who drew it, um, but uh, it showed a, a classroom, and it was breaking down all the, uh, the denominations of Christianity. It started off with um, you know, the first generation in the beginning of the first century, and then it showed how it split off 
um, into the Jonian community and, and the Catholic bishops started to split up and then you started, you know, it had the Protestant Red Mission and then all the different ones coming off of that. It's this huge, like, tree of branches. And then at the very end, it said, you know, like the uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran Baptist whatever, you know, Reformation of 1915 at the, you know, at the very end. And then the classroom was saying, you know, and we got it right, right here. And isn't isn't uh, yeah. Jesus lucky that we came along? <laughs> you guys, you guys posted yeah. that on your Facebook page, didn't you? I don't think I did. I think I, I saw it. I, on do, Reddit I do somewhere. remember seeing it, and that's yeah. exactly right. It's just, it was a huge, like blackboard, and it had all these different tree branches. Mm -hmm. It looked like it looked like a, the playoffs, mm -hmm. but if there was thousands of teams. Yeah. So. It's yeah, it's it's pretty funny, um, but yeah, I mean, it's no, nobody has this stuff right. Even if it, any of it were right, it's it's guesswork um, by a, by a lot. And uh, I think something that religious people could benefit from is is uh, recognizing the possibility that they are incorrect much more strongly than they do. Atheists are really good at this. Um, they will admit outright that we could be wrong, that, you know, technically we're agnostic atheists, that, um, you know, we could always discover evidence that will change our mind and blah, blah, blah. Atheists don't tend to admit things like that, and it makes them feel um, un, um, uh, w without, without proper warrant more confident in what their position is. It's the same problem you have, it's called the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, it's the same problem that you have in science, where you have legitimate PhD level research scientists coming out with a study saying, okay, we have this evidence, um, you know, we have to repeat this study, uh, it needs more research, uh, but this could suggest a possible link between blah, 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 and we're not, we're not making that claim, but, you know, and they, they, they just, they, uh, they soften it so much to, to avoid making a, a statement about something that they that might not be true. Um, whereas you have you know college freshmen who just took their first evolutionary biology class, and they'll they'll start telling you all sorts of things, like oh well you know it's science proves that blah blah blah, and the the PhD guys are going no it didn't prove that it's just that's how we think it works right now, <laughs> and uh, yeah but. You got to be careful about religious people trying to say that something is a certain way, and they know this because they don't know it. They believe it, and they might have a justification. They might even have a good justification, but it's still a belief. And if you can, if you can help them make that mental paradigm shift from this is true to this is what I believe, it's a huge step in the direction of uh, of seeking truth honestly. Uh, and being intellectually honest about that process. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, usually when I begin a discussion with someone. I the best one of the very first things I'll ask them is I'll, I'll ask them, "Have you read the Bible? Have you read, you know?" And then I, it's been like one percent that have said yes, I've read the Bible. And then it's used to cover to cover, or and like it's a very slim number. And then, of course, they turn the question on to me and say, have you read the Bible? And I say, yes. And they're like, well, well why have you read the Bible? I said, because if I'm going to be an atheist, I mean, I was an atheist before I read the Bible. I was never really religious. I was just, out of curiosity, I wanted to read the Bible. And uh, reading the Bible just helped solidify everything that I thought about religion, and especially Christianity. Um and that's that's a very uh, important topic I think to bring up with them in a discussion is uh you know why why is it that when people do read it that they're more inclined to believe it less? Yeah, I, I mean just because people don't tend to know because their pastors don't tend to tell them for obvious reasons that the Bible com uh, contains some extremely unlikely claims. Um, Noah's Ark, I mean, I've, this comes back to the desensitization thing. We are so used to this story because we're told about it when we're four years old um, that it doesn't seem, like, laughable to it. I mean, it does, you know, logically seem laughable. But the idea that adults think this has any basis in reality 
is, I mean, we should be putting people in mental hospitals for thinking that that is even remotely possible if we're rational about this. That is stupid to believe that. The only reason that we don't do this is because it's part of our culture that this is a f actual possibility because so many people believe it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's kind of sad that we live in a society where it is perfectly, the majority believes it's perfectly acceptable that a man lived in a, a fish for three days, but evolution is the creation of Satan. It's, you know, Satan created evolution, sci and scientists are the work of Satan. Yeah, uh, and I mean that's just ignorance as far as you know what. I, I, I mean, that, yeah, that yeah, is a that yeah. Is there's a there's plenty case, of religious people, but... right? There are plenty of religious people who who understand what evolution is and, and therefore accept it. It's my experience that people who do not accept evolution cannot define evolution, um, and they might they might not believe in natural selection as the mechanism for evolution, but uh, or excuse me, as the mechanism for speciation, but. Uh, evolution is absolutely proven, and everybody who understands the definition knows that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, you were talking before about you know just having read the Bible. Uh, Bill Keller Ministries, which is a, uh, it's a, uh, I mean it, it's a ministry, but they they also commission uh, surveys and things like that, and they're they're legitimate. They they do a good job. Um, by their estimate, uh, ninety percent. Or not, I think it was 90 or 90 plus. I can't remember. One of those two uh, percent of professing Christians have not read the Bible cover to cover. Um, in my experience, it's much higher than that. I, I seriously doubt one in ten Christians has read the Bible. Um, the people who have read the Bible tend to be Bible scholars, theologians, preachers, and atheists. Uh, and I always re recommend to people that they read the Bible if they haven't read it because the Bible is f just honestly one of our number I, I, I don't want to say like weapons because that's not accurate but it's one of uh, truths uh, number one uh, tools for getting itself across um, when people read the Bible they start to realize that there is some crazy stuff in there that is not believable and yeah once they see it in black and white then they have to stop believing this is a completely true book. Um, pastors, I mean, th there's a reason that they read to you from it, and they don't want you to talk about all the other stuff that's in there uh, because it has a tendency to affect people's faith, and they know that, and their living depends on it. Um, some of them are more honest and will talk to you about those other things, and they have actual justifications for why they're in there. Some of them, uh, I, I know for a fact, have not actually read the Bible themselves, so they don't know what's in there. Um, but, yeah, read the Bible if you haven't, is what I would tell a, a person who is religious um, and, uh, and hasn't seriously asked why they're religious before. It will... It will not. I don't want to say most likely, but it has a good history of making people into atheists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, kind of to the point that we were talking. Uh, I mean, I, I raised my daughter to be a, a critical thinker and just skeptical of everything. And uh, I do read. I do read the Bible to her. Um, and just on the first page, we're reading Genesis, and she she immediately. She goes. She told me she's like, I, I need you to stop. I said, Yeah. She goes, That that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and so, I could I feel like I had succeeded a little bit as a secular parent of teaching her uh, some skepticism and to question and everything. And uh, so I, I've, I've you know that's just it. I've, if a six year old can read it and be like, mm, I don't know about that. It's Kind of, it's, it is a scary thought that some adults can read it and then still follow it. Yeah, and and children, in my experience, are actually quite good at asking why. Um, it, they they want to know more information. It, in there, I mean, they're unfortunately also easy to uh, to inculcate, um, but children are naturally curious, and it's not really until people stamp that out of them that they, they lose that. Uh, some people never do, which is wonderful. But, um, 
yeah, I mean, on the first page of, of the Old Testament of Genesis, you know, the, the, there are days before the sun exists. I mean, and some people try to say, well, what that really means is a 24-hour period. Obviously, it wasn't a physical 360-year rotation of our planet. Like, like that uh, Philosoraptor meme. It says, mm -hmm. the sun wasn't created till the fourth day. How did four days pass? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and you can make excuses, you know, for how that might work. But you have to understand that when people are, when people do that, when they try to justify it like that, they're making it up. It doesn't say that in there. They're just, they're just trying to rescue it from being shown wrong. And if, unless they have evidence that it really meant X, and they are just claiming X, and now they're making their job harder because now they have to not only justify that the Bible is accurate, but that um, the reasons that they are giving are accurate too. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're just piling on more unsubstantiated claims and giving themselves more and more burdens of, of proving things every time they, they try to explain something that doesn't make sense that isn't directly said in there. Right. Yeah, and you, that's just the, the blind faith. Just uh, what's what is that quote? Is uh, when you have you you atheists usually go, come to something with with evidence, and they try to piece it together to what it makes sense. When they have they have the Bible, and then they try to refute the evidence to make sure that the Bible is true. Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a common tactic um, for for any religionist. Um, the, I mean, the way empiricism works is you start with uh, an observation, and then you hypothesize about uh, an, a possible explanation for that, and then you work about disproving uh, your, your hypothesis um, by looking for evidence that counters it. Um, that's the opposite of the way faith works. The way faith works is you start with your conclusion, um, which in empiricism you never have conclusions. Uh, you, you can you can get to you know 99.9999 percent confidence uh, is you know as far as confidence intervals and stuff, but you you would never say this is how it works. Period, because you could always discover new evidence that shows that you're wrong. It's called the problem of induction uh, that that David Hume talked about. But um, yeah, I mean only only in mathematics and in faith uh, approaches can you say this is proven. This is a fact. Um, and obviously, on a faith-based approach, I, I would disagree that something is a fact um, just because you say it is. But um, yeah, it, they they will say you know they will make abs, uh, absolute claims like that, certainty claims like that um, that that I I don't see how they can justify it. And, they, and they, I mean, they can't, but they try. Right. It's, they just they try they try the damnedest. So. All right. Well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on, Dave. Um, is there uh, give us some shout outs to American Atheists? And yeah. Um, yeah. If uh, if you like this sort of stuff, um, if this goes well, and it, I don't know how many, uh, I've got what somewhere around 140 tweets that are tagged with with this tonight. Um, if uh, if people seem to think this went well and it was a good idea and they liked it, I think that we should continue with this. This is something uh, I've I've been with American Atheists for six months now, and this was an idea that I had um, that I that I brought to this organization that I actually talked about in my interview as something I wanted to do if if I was brought on here. Um, and I really like this idea. I would like to continue it. I have many more topics that I could cover in in this amount of detail. Um, or, or less because this is now two and a half hours. But um, uh, but yeah, if this is something that you guys like, um, feel free to send me ideas for future, uh, I guess, episodes. Um, my email address is uh, dmuscato, that's D-M-U-S-C-A-T-O, at atheists.org. That's atheists, plural. Um, if you want to support what we do, um, you are certainly welcome to do that. We encourage that. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that depends on member donations um, to, to run what, what it is that we do. If you go to atheists.org slash donate, uh, you can support us there. Um, if you'd like to become a member of American Atheists, uh, we send you a nice packet with a membership card. You get our newsletter, um, all sorts of other great stuff. Uh, if you go to atheists.org slash membership. Um, awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can. Uh, we also have a. Um, he's holding it up there. If you want to say something, so it'll switch over to your screen. Say something. <laughs> that's uh, that's the American Atheist magazine. Uh, we we have uh, subscriptions here. It's twenty dollars a year, um, or you can go to Barnes and Noble and and get it there. Um, that we publish uh, four times a year. We have a newsletter um, that we publish every other month. We have emails that go out. Uh, uh, with updates uh, on a more regular basis that go out all, every Thursday, um, yeah, lots of lots of great stuff. Um, but yeah, memberships. Um, there there are different levels of membership if you want to support us more. But the basic level is thirty five dollars a year. You get a discount on our convention uh, if you are not yet a member and you sign up for membership uh, when you register for the convention. Um, and if you've never been to an atheist convention, or especially if you've never been to one of ours, uh, you really should check it out. They're so much fun. Um, there, I mean, this is this is where good stuff happens. It's where you get to hang out with other atheists. You get to meet all your favorite speakers. You get to hang out with them, have them sign your books and stuff, and ask them whatever questions you have for them. Um, the the real, I mean. There's there's very you know there's informative talks that's that's obviously you know the, the purpose of it but really the fun of this stuff of conventions it happens in in the evenings after the the scheduled stuff is over you spend time talking to other atheists from all over the country and hearing about their experiences with atheism and I mean this is where my best friends uh, where I met them is at these conventions and I know people nationwide. Uh, who are, I'm very close with, who I talk to, you know, on Facebook or whatever, because we live across the country from each other. But um, I mean, one of the things that I look forward to the most is going to these things and seeing these people. It's it just it's a wonderful experience. It's it's a community that you're joining that a lot of people miss when they leave religion if they were part of a church community and. Um, yeah, the, the conference scene is just, it's amazing. It's, you, you really should be a part of it if you're not yet. Um, yeah. our, uh, Absolutely. I, can, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was going to okay. say, uh, that's exactly it. Um, like I said, I was just a, a normal atheist until I went to the one in Austin, and that was the first time that uh, I was in a room with other atheists, and what we had a 1,000 atheists there. 936, I think, was the final count. Yeah, yeah, I mean that that is a ridiculous amount of number. I mean, we're, we're that's unheard of, and it was in Texas, so <laughs> it was it was great. It was a great experience. I learned so much, and really, the biggest thing it was a huge inspiration for me to become more motivated, more uh, out there, and more outspoken, and to do as much as I could to continue uh, the work, and it's led to all this. Yeah, um, and and same here. I mean, it's uh, it's because of getting involved in stuff like this that that led me to become a writer and a blogger about atheism. Um, uh, my uh, my college uh, atheist group we we put on a, our own conference, um, and uh, I I went from that to an internship in an atheist organization, and that led to me here. And I mean, it's all because of becoming part of this community that that I have my entire career, and I, I owe a lot to that. Um, but yeah, if uh, if you want to come to the convention, uh, you can register online. The website is atheists.org/convention2014, and it's got all the information about our speakers um, and uh, the you know registration to, to get your tickets and stuff like that. Um, the speakers list is it's really wonderful. We've made uh, a special effort this year um, to bring in. Uh, Keynote speakers who are who are new to the atheist mo movement. Um, all three of our keynote speakers have never before spoken to an atheist audience, and they're all like famous people. These are these are people. I mean, they're they're non-believers, but uh, we wanted to sh to to help people understand not just atheists, but you know the general public because th these things are publicized in the news. That uh, it's it's a normal part of just being an American. Uh, that there are people who are atheists that you already know and have heard of and admire, um, like Chris Cluey, the you know the Oakland Raiders punter who's our keynote, and um, Denise Stapley from Survivor Philippines, and uh, Mark White from the band The Spin Doctors, um, and and like I mentioned earlier, you know we have about 30 other speakers scheduled so far. Um, uh, Juan Mendez, 
um, we're talking to him about bringing him in. He's uh, a, a state senator from Arizona who uh, made headlines a, a month or two ago uh, for giving a humanist uh, opening quote unquote prayer at a at a council meeting. Um, let's see. I mean, just all sorts of people we have. The, uh, yeah. Was that the Sagan quote? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Um, yep. Um, yeah. There, there's a bunch of people. Miriam Namasi, uh, Barry Lynn, who's the he's a reverend and he's also the head of Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. Um, a bunch of people. Yeah. Go to the website. Read the list of people. Uh, it's it's a really great lineup and it's in Salt Lake City, uh, which is going to be really interesting. We're working on some ideas about how we can get involved. Uh, with the Mormon community there. Um, one thing that we're really trying to do this year, the reason that we're in Salt Lake City, it, the, the conference moves around every year. It was in Austin last year. It was in Washington, D.C. the year before that. Um, but there's a, an enormous number of people who used to be Mormon uh, who are now not, but they, they even if they don't believe in God, they don't identify as atheists. They haven't adopted that name for themselves. They call themselves ex-Mormons. And that's something that we want to help uh, to help change if I mean if you don't believe in God you're an atheist and there right. are reasons that people don't want to call themselves atheists because the word has a stigma and that's why we exist that's part of our actual mission statement is to destigmatize the word atheist to make make it comfortable for people to say I'm an atheist if you don't believe in God um, so we, we really want to reach out to this community who is ha nobody has really tried to do that yet that we're aware of and it's something that we want to do this year um, but yeah, uh, check it out. In addition to uh, to the talks and hanging out with people, like I mentioned, there's also an art show and an art auction. There's um, uh, a costume party. There's um, uh, we're doing karaoke this year, which we haven't done before, but we'll see how that goes. Um, hopefully, there's hopefully a, a lot of beer for that. Yeah, one. yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is a bunch of great stuff. We've got uh, some stand-up comedy lined up. We've got some live music. Um, it's it's really going to be a fantastic weekend. It's Easter weekend, 2014, uh, in Salt Lake City, and all the details are at atheists.org slash convention 2014. So yeah, uh, I'll yeah, go, go ahead. ahead and I'll put all the links in the uh, video description so great. everyone will be, have quick access to them. Okay, um, cool. But... All right, yeah, well, um, well uh, yeah, let me just run through uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, three go more ahead. things. Um, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, you're certainly welcome to. I don't, I don't tweet on my account a whole lot. I do the, uh, the American Atheists account, which is uh, twitter.com slash American Atheist, singular, um, at American Atheist is, is, our, is our name on there. Um, uh, join our Facebook page, which is just uh, facebook.com slash American Atheists. Um, we put a lot of funny stuff up there, memes and things. We put a lot of serious articles, um, announcements. Um, a lot of a good discussion happens there, too, uh, in the comment threads. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, if, you, if you would like to contact me for copies of these slides from today or um, uh, if you just have questions about anything else, um, feel free to either tweet me. My email address, again, is dmoscato at atheists.org, or my office number here is 908-276-7300, and my extension is 7. Um, so yeah, we really hope that you stay in touch with us, um, consider becoming a member, um, and uh, yeah, a really, member. yeah, come come see us at the convention in, in uh, Salt Lake City in April. Yeah, and I, I gotta tell everyone that you should come anyways, because I'm gonna be there. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, Dave, well, uh, I really appreciate you uh, coming on and taking the time to go over debating and uh, uh, educating. Uh, that's what that's really what I started forming these Hangouts to do is just to bring people on and different perspectives from different angles and uh, different information. So Great, I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. I, I hope this was, uh, this was useful to people, um, and we're going to be doing more of these, I think. Um, so, yeah, email me or, or tweet me or whatever. Let me know. Uh, what you'd like us to cover, because I can I can put something together about you know various different things. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm doing I'm really shooting for right now probably at least three a week, three hangouts a week. Oh wow, yeah, I can't put them together that fast, but <laughs> um, but yeah, well, I'd be totally Matt, down for like once a Matt, month or something uh, like that. I, yeah. I have a bunch of topics lined up, like I said, morality, 
Uh, I want to do a military atheist segment. Um, th things like that. Um, just bringing different perspectives in. Uh, I do a lot of panel discussions, uh, but I really like the aspect of the live questions as well. Um, yeah, I so. think that, that was a good idea. I, I really enjoyed that, um, people tweeting stuff in. Next time, I think I want to set it up so that we can also take questions on Facebook or, or something like that for people. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was difficult to go between. I was, I was trying to do it, go between Twitter, Facebook, and, and uh, YouTube, and the YouTube comments weren't updating. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is our first one. You know, we're we're learning how to how to do the technical side of it. But exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. That's why that's why I keep telling everybody this is live, and we still are live. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But but it's technology. We're figuring it out, and uh, I enjoy the you know being being more interactive with with the community. Uh, it definitely brings us. I, I I think it brings us more in together as a as a community, and uh, as long as it's you know. Doing a positive reinforcement and uh, helping helping the cause. I'm there. Me too. Sounds great. All right. Well, I enjoy having you on and to see everybody again. Thanks, guys. Appreciate